Okay, cool. Good afternoon, uh, procurement fans. <laughs> Good afternoon, procurement fans. Welcome to the Contracts Committee of the New York City Council. Today is Thursday, June 21st, 2018. My name is Justin Brennan. I have the privilege of co-chairing this hearing along with my fellow council member, Steve Levin, um, chair of the Committee on General Welfare. I'd like to extend my thanks to Chair Levin as well as the members of both committees for coming together to hold uh, this important hearing. The purpose of today's hearing is to discuss this administration's implementation of the so-called model budget process, uh, which was adopted during the last fiscal year in order to address ongoing contract fulfillment issues between the city and um, nonprofits in the human service sector. These organizations are the frontline providers for critical and necessary city services, and we outsource a significant amount of city responsibility to them. Whether that means providing child welfare services to families at risk, offering caregiver resources to the city's seniors, or operating homeless shelters, these nonprofits constitute an essential component of our basic social service sector, and we are failing them. The model budgeting process was designed to adjust pricing rates and address salary disparities in order to expedite contract payments across the human services sector, yet contract delays persist and these providers are forced to continue operating at a deficit. While we in the Contracts Committee admire the effort taken by a select few city agencies in this arena, we cannot stress enough the impact that payment delays have on these organizations. When contractors performing vital city services are routinely paid late and underpaid for their contracts, it discourages anyone in the human services sector from carrying out this business on behalf of the city. These providers are essentially city workers without the benefits. If we cannot find a way to pay them an appropriate amount and an appropriate amount and on time, then ultimately the city will be left responsible for the people under their care. We need to figure this out and we need to figure it out soon. So these providers do uh, run the risk of insolvency as they float the cost of their services for indeterminate amounts of time. I know Chair Levin is eager to discuss the details of the model budget and get right into discussion with HRA Commissioner Banks, so I'll defer to him on discussion of the details of the model budget program. However, before I turn the floor over to him, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the other council members that are here today. Adrian Adams, Richie Torres, Alan Mazel, Inez Barron, Mark Joni, and Brad Lander. I also want to thank the inimitable Contracts Committee staff, my legislative counsel, Alex Polonoff, uh, policy analyst, Casey Addison, finance analyst, Andrew Wilbur, and finance unit head, John Russell, as well as my senior advisor, Jonathan Yedin, for all their hard work in putting uh, this important hearing together. And Chair Levin, I will give you the floor. Thank you very much, Chair Brannon. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Councilmember Steve Levin, Chair of the Council's Committee on General Welfare. I want to thank you all for attending today's hearing on model budgets for human services contracts. Thanks also to my colleague, Justin Brannon, Chair of the Committee on Contracts, for bringing this issue to the forefront today. The city relies heavily on the not-for-profit sector, uh, human services sector, to provide critical services to millions of New Yorkers, including vulnerable populations, such as children, seniors, people with disabilities, and individuals and families experiencing homelessness. The not-for-profit human services sector is one of the largest employers in our city. It provides essential services such as early childhood education, shelter, job training, and senior care. While the sector steps in to fill the needs that the city cannot possibly do on its own, we know that it has been historically underfunded. In fiscal year 2017, <clears throat> the city made historic investments in human service contracts to not-for-profit providers including funding for cost of living adjustments, otherwise known as COLAs, funding <clears throat> to raise indirect rates, and the creation of a model budget for specific program areas to, to delve into chronic funding issues and better align dollars with resources. These investments were a crucial step in changing longstanding issues that prevent not-for-profits from accessing much-needed resources. Among the program areas that the city identified for additional funding was ACS's preventive services. 
Recognizing the fiscal challenges facing not-for-profits delivering child welfare services, the city budget for FY18 includes $26.3 million in increased funding for preventive services at ACS to develop a quality model budget to assist providers in raising salaries, retaining staff, strengthening training, supervision, and quality assurance, and improving the delivery of services to children and families. ACS underwent a model budget process in phases and gathered lessons along the way, including the importance of a more transparent and collaborative process to ensure providers get access to funding as efficiently as possible. ACS conducted focus groups, organized a listening tour, and completed research and data analysis to inform enhancements that would later be made. ACS also held workshops to answer provider questions and provide technical assistance along the way. Agencies like ACS ha uh, appear to be well underway in the model budget process. Some of their work could potentially be used as a rubric for other agencies undergoing the same process in the future. The Department of Homeless Services, DHS, is also undergoing the model budgeting process. In 2018, an additional $36.2 million, growing to $71 million in 2020, will support, sh will support shelter rate reform. This funding will be used to amend reimbursement rates across providers to improve the Im quality of shelter and services, as well as increase accountability. However, the progress of the amendments has been slow, and most providers have not had any contract amendments reflecting updated per diem rates. Without improved rates, it is very difficult for most providers to maintain a satisfactory level of basic services and hire additional staff members to assist shelter clients with rehousing and case management. Um, we're looking forward to hearing from, uh, from Commissioner Banks and DHS um, the, uh, an update on the process of, of these model budgets and, um, and uh, uh, kind of an outlook on when they can be completed. Uh, look, uh, I'd like to underscore that the model budget process is meant to be a tool. It shouldn't just fix currently underfunded contracts. The goal should be that it changes how things are done overall. Um, the, the model budgeting process shouldn't be seen as a one-time exercise. It should be set forth and establish better processes for the future, especially given that 90 new shelters will be created in the years to come as the objective of the de Blasio administration. Today's, at today's hearing, the General Welfare Committee is interested in learning how the model budget process is progressing. The committee is also interested in understanding the methodologies the respective agencies use during the process. Um, we're interested to see um, where there are similarities, where there are differences, and why those similarities and differences may be uh, in place. We'd also like to explore what improvements can be made in the processes that are still being implemented and how best we can engage providers throughout. We also want to discuss lessons learned. For instance, we want to examine how DHS will establish best practices and standards from the model budgeting process so that rates don't fall behind like they have under previous administrations. In light of the uh, recent allegations, in addition, in light of recent allegations, we also have concerns regarding security at shelters, and we'd like to discuss how the contracting process can address these issues going forward. DHS should be using these contracts to drive the industry standard around security practices and protocol and a critically needed training, and we want to hear how that process is moving forward. I would like to thank uh, General, Willi General Welfare Committee staff for their hard work in preparing for today's hearings, uh, Committee Counsel Aminta Kilowan, Policy Analyst Tanya Cyrus and Crystal Pond, Finance Analyst Namira Newshot and Daniel Krupp, and Finance Unit Head Dohini Sampura. I would like to also thank the staff of the Contracts Committee as well. And I'd like to thank my Chief of Staff, Jonathan Boucher, Policy Director Edward Paulino, and Legislative Director Elizabeth Adams. And now I will turn it back over to Councilmember Brannon. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Levinuk. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Alex Polinoff to swear you guys in. Uh, would you please raise your right hands? <coughs> Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairpersons Levin and Brannon, and members of the General Welfare and Contracts Committees. Uh, my name is Stephen Banks, and I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Social Services. And in that capacity, I oversee the Human Resources Administration and the Department of Homeless Services. Joining me today is the Department of Social Services Chief Program 
uh, Planning and Financial Management Officer Ellen Levine, also uh, Jamar Hooks, uh, Intergovernmental Affairs. Thank you for inviting uh, me to appear before you today to discuss one of the critical reforms adopted following the comprehensive 90-day review of the delivery of homeless services. Rate rationalization for homeless services uh, in order to ensure that shelter providers are resourced to be true partners with us in making reforms to improve homeless services. As we develop the funding parameters for the specific components of the services that our partners provide, a model evolved, hence the term model budget. DHS has invested more than a quarter of a billion dollars annually in our not-for-profit shelter providers to address decades of disinvestment and to modernize the outdated rates that have been paid for too long. This has been done to ensure that they are able to deliver the high quality services homeless New Yorkers deserve as they get back on their feet. The challenge of homelessness did not occur overnight and it won't be solved overnight. Following a 90 day review of homeless services in 2016, <coughs> we developed and are currently implementing comprehensive reforms to transform the city's approach to providing homeless services and shelter. The review was guided by these goals, providing quality services to vulnerable clients, efficient use of city resources, and achieving cost effectiveness by avoiding duplication. The review resulted in 46 reforms that built on initiatives that the administration had already started to undertake in order to prevent and alleviate homelessness. This included reinstating comprehensive rental assistance programs, allocating historic funding for civil legal services for tenants, and a bold commitment to the preservation and creation of what is now 300,000 units of affordable housing. With the exponential increase in the shelter population, <coughs> including a 115% increase from 1994 to 2014, it had been incre uh, become increasingly difficult for DHS to adequately oversee and monitor providers, ensure safe, clean, and secure conditions, and provide necessary services to clients. As such, uh, as a result of the 90-day uh, review and the work beforehand, we began our work to enhance shelter services immediately, which has resulted in the following. A shelter repair scorecard to track improvements in shelter conditions that is posted on the Mayor's Office of Operations website each month. An enhanced shelter repair program that has remediated 12,000 violations in shelters and reduced shelter violations by 84%, with many of the remaining conditions requiring capital repairs that are being funded. Through nearly 34,000 inspections in 2016 and 2017, and another 5,333 inspections through April of this fiscal year. <coughs> Enhanced social services programs within shelters, including restoring HRA's domestic violence services at DHS shelters that had been eliminated in 2010, and augmented shelter security with the NYPD now overseeing shelter security, including implementation of 200 hours of enhanced training developed by the NYPD for all new and in-service DHS peace officers and the creation of a new DHS peace officer tactical training facility at the Bedford Atlantic Men's Assessment Shelter. <coughs> Our Turning the Tide on Homelessness Plan announced just over a year ago puts people and communities first. The plan has four key pillars, preventing homelessness in the first place whenever we can, bringing people in from the streets 24 seven, rehousing people who have become homeless and transforming the haphazard approach to providing shelter and services that has been used over the past nearly four decades. Specifically with respect to shelters, through turning the tide, we will shrink the footprint of DHS shelters by 45% by ending the use of decades old stopgap measures at 360 shelter locations, like cluster shelter sites that began to be used in the Giuliani administration and commercial hotel rooms that have been used off and on since the 1960s. Instead, we plan to open an ultimately smaller number of 90 new high-quality borough-based shelters to help families and individuals stay connected to the anchors of life, such as schools, jobs, health care, families, houses of worship, as they get back on their feet. The process for opening these shelters will involve community engagement, and we've committed to notifying communities no less than 30 days prior to the siting of any new shelter. While we have much work to do to address the decades-old challenge of homelessness, through implementation of the four pillars of our plan, we are moving in the right direction as evidenced by these results so far. The DHS shelter census for 2017 remained roughly flat compared to 2016. This is the first time in more than a decade that the DHS census has remained flat. We've gotten out of 100 shelter locations, bringing our shelter footprint from 647 buildings 
we reported in the Turning the Tide plan a year ago to our current use of 547 buildings, a 16% reduction in one year, including reducing the use of clusters by nearly 50% by ending the use of nearly 1,700 cluster units from this 18-year-old program, and citing 20 new borough-based shelters with 13 already operating. Evictions by city marshals have dropped by 27%, and more than 70,000 New Yorkers have been able to stay in their homes while we expanded tenant legal services and rent arrears payments. We've helped 1,815 people come in from the streets and get access to transitional programs or permanent housing. Today, these 1,815 people remain off the streets. We've created and are implementing rental assistance programs and restoring Section 8 and New York City Housing Authority priorities, which through March 2018, have helped 87,300 children and adults move out of or avert entry into shelter. It's the fourth pillar of our plan that we'll be focusing on in our testimony today, transforming the haphazard approach to providing shelter and services that has built up over nearly four decades as New York City's response to the right to shelter court orders. In order to address underinvestment in maintenance, security, and services, the city's 90-day review reforms include a commitment to rationalizing shelter provider rates for contracted sites. Beginning in April of 2016, following the adoption of the recommendations from the 90-day review, DHS worked with various stakeholders, including representatives from the shelter provider community and oversight agencies, to develop a set of parameters and guidelines. This became the model. In 2017, an audit by the State Controller's Office included a note commending DHS for developing the model budget tool. The model budget exercise uses a set of templates to assist in evaluating all aspects of the provision of shelter. Uh, we are projecting up during this testimony a PowerPoint which highlights the overview of the process, and I'm sure as we get into questions, we can refer to the PowerPoint process uh, in this process. The model budget exercise uses a set of templates, as I said, to assist in evaluating all aspects of the provision of shelter, maintenance, staffing, client services, et cetera, there are uh, that are specific to shelter capacity and shelter type to determine a facility's appropriate annual budget. Aligned with our move away from the previous one-size-fits-all approach, the model accounts for different populations, families with children, adult families, and single adult shelter, various single adult shelter types, including mental health, substance use, employment, assessment, and general population, and the relative size of a shelter, providing staffing and funding for services based on each of these elements, cross-checked with the site-specific capacity and line item costs, which produces an overall per diem and annual budget. The models reflect ongoing priorities identified by the department and the State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance regarding shelter repairs, and are reflective of state requirements contained within New York Code Rules and Regulations Part 900 and Part 491, as well as city regulations and statutes as appropriate. The model covers both personnel costs, PS, and other than personnel costs, OTBS. The model uses the site's capacity to produce an overall per site per diem, the daily rate per household or individual, that is translated to an annual budget. The per diem is built from various components of the model, which standardizes rates to provide consistent and sustained support for quality services. These rates are calibrated for shelter size and include maintenance, client supplies, food, transportation, and shelter administration. Another component of the model is the establishment of staff-to-client ratios for direct service staff. For example, caseworkers, supervisors, housing specialists, social workers, peer specialists, recreation staff, and residential aides across all contracted shelter providers along with funding so that providers can meet and maintain these ratios for their individual shelter capacity. The models are flexible enough that with proper justification, providers are able to adjust specific line items, ensuring the budget meets all necessary requirements and appropriately reflects the unique operation of that particular shelter. That said, a site's budget cannot go over the total model per diem and generally may not exceed the bottom line within a category. While other components of the shelter budget are not subject to the same parameters because they're unique to each site, they're part of the model in the sense that they are part of each provider's budget and are based on impartial documented standards. The key shelter costs unique to each site include rent, utilities, insurance, and security. Appropriate rent values are determined by analyzing a number of factors, including but not limited to the housing, urban development, small market, fair market rent, 
comparable sales in the neighborhood, comparable price per square foot in the neighborhood, current published unit rental rates in the neighborhood, current use of the building, rehabilitation costs, average per diem for comparable shelter, capacity and population, and capacity needs. Rates for utilities and insurance are based upon documented actual costs. Security levels are determined in consultation with NYPD and take into account factors such as access control, vertical shifts, and line of sight. Another component of the model budget is a new unprecedented way of addressing approved one-time new needs. An example of this would be a one-time cost to replace a boiler that could not be accommodated with the regular maintenance and repair budget. The new contracts establish a separate budget line for each site that allows providers to access DHS's system-wide repair fund after the new need approval process without requiring an additional contract amendment. In the current exercise, our shelter providers uh, to make the contract our, uh, with our shelter providers to make the contract adjustments for the model, funding for rent, utilities, insurance, and security is included in an individual providers' contract amendment to in the event or to the extent that funding is required to bring them to the standard or required levels. The FY18, FY20 cost of living COLA and minimum wage adjustments and the increase in the citywide not-for-profit indirect cost rate are also included in these amendments. Beginning with the funding added in the FY17 executive budget, we have dedicated an unprecedented resources to reform the rates as well as develop the structure to provide standard and equitable funding to not-for-profit social services providers to deliver the services our homeless clients rely on as they get back on our feet. This includes deploying social workers and family shelters as part of the First Lady's NYC Thrive Initiative, as well as increasing funding for providers for shelter maintenance and repairs. This $236 million investment in our not-for-profit sector will result in better facilities and services for our clients and is in addition to $163 million we already spend annually for health and mental health services across the system. In July 2017, DHS began using a template for the model budget to phase in the rate reform for existing shelter providers through a process that includes individual negotiations with the providers, a budget amendment process, and individual budget approval by OTDA, the State Oversight Agency. The model budget has been used for providers proposing new shelter sites as well, including the 13 currently operating shelters under, uh, under the Turn the Tide Plan new shelters. DHS developed quartiles to manage the workload with all provider budgets furthest below the model in the first quartile. All contracts within an individual provider's portfolio are being negotiated and processed at the same time to avoid duplicative work for the providers. There are 46 providers and 139 uh, shelter operations that are in the model budget amendment process now. This does not include new sites or contracts that previously were adjusted for the model because they were in a contract negotiation phase at the time the model budget process began. These contracts are already within the model. Once providers have submitted a budget proposal using the standard template, the DHS Shelter Program Budget Office compares the proposed budgets to the model and then negotiates along with DHS program staff using this tool. This is a process that is completed in close consultation and partnership with each individual provider. The process then continues with recommendations for the budget changes going to the DHS Finance Office and the New York City Office of Management and Budget for approval. After the approvals are in place, the contract moves into the amendment phase, which includes legal and procedural checks culminating registration with the controller's office. Before today's hearing, we sampled the contracts that have been approved, and we want to give you a sense of where the money goes. Out of our sample, 18% of the new funding is for direct care services, including caseworkers, housing specialists, and con counseling. 14% <coughs> is for maintenance. 11% is for indirect costs increases, and 30% is for security. On average, the sites in the lowest quartile that are, have approved budgets are receiving nearly a million dollars in annual increases, not including the FY18 COLA. We've also worked closely with our not-for-profit partners to update performance evaluation so that together we can raise the bar for supports that we provide to homeless New Yorkers at all of our shelter locations citywide. We look forward to continuing that collaboration as we proceed with the implementation of our new performance management approach. The new shelter performance approach includes an important management evaluation process to help both the agency and our providers measure some of the most critical indicators to tell us if our investments are paying off. 
We could not necessarily expect previously under-resourced providers to immediately meet the standards, but the model budget is intended to make sure that our investments and our expectations are aligned. Similar to the model budget process, we held meetings with representatives of not-for-profit agencies, incorporated their feedback, and uh, we're now excited to be rolling out a new approach that will help our providers manage towards our common goals. We've heard positive feedback from many of our providers. They tell us that they want to have access to information to manage and improve their services. The challenge of homelessness didn't occur overnight and won't be solved overnight, but our city's comprehensive strategies are taking hold, and we're committed to continually finding ways to do better for the New Yorkers we serve. After the work we did to develop the shelter provider budget model for what are arguably the most complicated contracts that we manage between the two agencies, DHS and HRA, uh, and DSS, we turned our attention to Adult Protective Services, APS. APS has contracts for protective services and for the community garden, guardian programs, and funding was added in the FY18 adopted budget for HRA to improve staff retention and provide parity with other similar service programs, such as the case management program at the Department for the Aging. For adult protective and community guarding programs serving New York City's most vulnerable clients, including clients facing abuse, neglect, or exploitation, unstable staff retention has had an impact on implementing and monitoring essential services. Some of these services are emergency, health-related, or life-saving. When staff members leave a position, caseloads increase for other workers until vacancies can be filled, creating a cycle of overtax workers looking for relief, as well as potential gaps in services or coverage. The funding increase is intended to address these issues and thus improve client functioning as the relationship between the case manager and the client may be an important factor in maintaining clients in the community, reducing risk of institutional care and or related outcomes such as length of stay as well as emergency room visits. HRA and the APS contractors negotiated the individual amendment values over the course of FY18. All budgets have been finalized and approved, including indirect rate adjustments and are in the process of being amended and submitted to the controller for registration. At the core of these budget reforms for our DHS HRA providers are maximizing a client-centered and cost-effective prevention-first focus to avert homelessness whenever possible and to transform the city's approach to services. While we still have much to do, we're continuing to make progress in addressing the cumulative impact of years of underinvestment. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and we welcome your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I want to zoom out a little bit. So I know we have um, Jennifer from Mox is here. Okay. Um, can I swear you in so we could ask you some questions? Or Alex will swear you in? Hi. <laughs> will you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and respond honestly to council member questions in your testimony? I do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just to zoom out a little bit, I know each agency is conducting um, their own sort of separate model budgeting process, right? Um, so, I guess to start, I mean, how are the funding and model budget processes moving along, and what steps are in place to ensure, because everyone is using their own process, um, you know, what steps are in place to make sure agencies are following the same guidelines or, and expectations? Sure. So um, the model budget process is one that is um, engaging the individual agencies with OMB. Um, so MOX hasn't been part of that. Um, and so I defer to the agencies about their process and their approach. I mean, due to the complexity of module model budgeting, is there a designated single point of contact responsible for coordination for the process for each agency? Yeah, I would defer to the agency that Commissioner Banks? Uh, yes, but let me give you a sense of a little bit on a more, more granular level. So we've run now two model budget processes, which I think um, uh, certainly provide some lessons. <clears throat> so in the APS model budget process, um, it, it was relatively a straightforward issue of determining uh, costs 
uh, in seven contracts and then uh, implementing that across, uh, across seven contracts. And so in a relatively short period of time, uh, the process con con uh, consists of engaging the providers, seeking their input, uh, uh, coming to a conclusion with uh, uh, the Office of Management Budget uh, and negotiating with the providers, and now moving forward with um, a process in which the amendments are all being uh, submitted to um, uh, the controller. I'm just looking at my notes. Uh, there are six contracts. Five of them are, are, will be at the controller by June 30th, uh, and the additional one has some issues and will be supported sh submitted shortly thereafter. In contrast, the DHS contracts are uh, complex contracts uh, across multiple sites where every individual site requires an individualized analysis because uh, uh, it's not a cookie cutter approach. Frankly, that was the approach that's been taken going back for almost 40 years. Uh, and so we spent uh, the first part of the process with the providers essentially meeting with, um, you know, I guess I would call it a, uh, representatives in a focused kind of discussion uh, for input before developing the model and then back and forth processes as the model is being developed and then moving into individual negotiations. So I think the process followed the same, uh, you know, markers, if you will, engagement with the providers first, not a take it or leave it starting point and then an iterative process back and forth. But the two processes show the complexity, a process with relatively few number of providers with essentially one task, which is to deal with uh, salary inequities uh, between the contracts in our APS agency and IFTA. Uh, that was a relatively uh, direct uh, uh, focus uh, versus the process at, at the Department of Homeless Services, which goes across uh, 46 different providers at 139 different sites. Having said that, the process has very four very clear phases. Um, as I said, to begin with, we divided the providers into quartiles. Those that were furthest from the model, we prioritized first. And any new shelter that we opened, we used the model for. Uh, and the four phases that any individual provider went through were template submission. Once we had the model budget template and we, pr we projected that up what the template looks like. Uh, then there is a review process, and then there's a negotiation process, and then there's a status process. Those are the sort of the four uh, markers. And you know, at this point in, for DHS, and I want to be responsive to a, 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 an opening question that I know Councilmember Levin uh, presented, and I think I can answer it in response to your question, which is 100% of the shelter providers have uh, the process has been initiated with now. 100% of them have the templates. Uh, 31 of the providers involved with 111 shelters have submitted their initial budget negotiation template. That's 67 percent of the shelters. 15 providers, 30, uh, uh, which operate about 28 of the locations, uh, that's 33 percent of the uh, total, have not yet submitted their uh, budget uh, initial budget negotiation template. Uh, but that's understandable, given that this is a sea change in uh, the way the providers are being asked to do business with us. Uh, that gives you sort of a bird's eye of how the process is advancing. Of the 31 providers, uh, again, involving 111 of the shelter sites that have submitted their templates, uh, uh, 12 of them involving 36, uh, 37 shelters were now in the process of scheduling a negotiation uh, session. 12 of them involving 56 shelters are in the negotiation process. Uh, and uh, in, most of that involves resubmissions that are coming back to us from providers. Uh, 17 shelters involving six providers in the quartile that was furthest away from the model have completed negotiations during the amendment process, uh, and uh, we expect uh, those to be submitted shortly uh, to the controller. Uh, I think there's even one that's been uh, further on in the process. Um, just to give you a, an overall sense, the uh, six providers, the 17 sites with finalized budgets will receive a total of $15 million in additional funding because of the model budget negotiations, uh, not including the coal adjustments. And then the coal adjustments for these uh, 17 sites for FY17 to 20, it's an additional increase of about $5.5 million. Of the 
uh, of this $15 million, about 2.7 million or 18% is for direct care services, 4.9 million, 33% is for security staff, uh, and 2.3 million and 15% is for maintenance, and 1.8 million or 12% is for increasing the indirect rate to 10%. Uh, is Jennifer still there? I'm here. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to get an idea. Help me understand. How does Mox view its oversight role in this in this process? Yeah, so the the model budget process is again really between the agency, OMB, and the providers. So Mox have, doesn't touch it at all. We're not a part of it. No. Okay. Um, so Commissioner Banks, I mean. What do you believe is causing contract delays then? Or is it funding issues, integrity issues, staffing, legal? Because I, you know, I hear from providers that this whole, this whole thing is a hot mess. And I'm sure so, we're going to hear that today. I know we're going to hear that today. So let's divide this into three. Uh, contract registration, model budget process, and payment. Right? I think that's a good way to divide it. And let me give you information on all three of them. Okay. Uh, let me start with contracts uh, with uh, a top line. You may, may remember that we conducted a 90-day uh, review in 2016 for a reason, which was to try to um, understand a number of different uh, challenges that uh, the city was facing in providing services, in, uh, including the Department of Homeless Services. And I think in some of the very first testimony that I gave about the 90-day review in March of 2016, we identified contracting uh, as an issue. And over the last 18 months, uh, we have processed uh, 1,100 uh, contract actions involving FY15, FY16, and FY17, including uh, amendments. Uh, and that's in addition to about 400 contract actions that we processed in FY18 for FY18 contracts. So this gives you a breadth of in an 18 month period of time, uh, the focus on dealing with an accumulation of challenges that have been dealt with here. So in an 18 month period of time, that's about 1500 contract actions of direct contracts and amendments uh, that we have processed. Uh, in terms of where we are on those, and I'm going to come to FY19 in a minute, but in terms of where we are on the FY15, 16, 17 contracts, uh, we're down to the following. For FY18, 98% of the contracts are registered and active. There are six contracts that are outstanding. Two, is at, two are at the controller and one is pending with a provider budget submission. Uh, I'll give you an overview of why contracts might be outstanding in a moment. For FY17, 99% of the FY17 contracts are registered and active. There are six contracts outstanding, of which one is pending a provider budget submission. For FY16, 99.8% of the contracts are registered and active. There is one contract outstanding at the controller. Uh, I have testified previously that we will not submit contracts where there are conditions problems unless there's a corrective action plan in place. Uh, and I know that that is a challenge in, for some providers, but it's part of a commitment that we've made not to submit contracts for registration until we can come to some closure on addressing conditions. In terms of 19, FY19, uh, there are 236 shelter contracts for FY19 uh, that need to be processed. Of these, 164 of them don't require any registration. They simply require uh, budgets from providers to be loaded into the system and then payments can be made. And I'll give you a, a, a top line on that in a moment. And there are 72 contracts that require registration for FY19. Uh, of the 72 contracts that are required for FY19, uh, one contract is already registered. 68% uh, or 49 contracts are currently on track uh, for submission to the controller uh, by July 1, uh, which again, if you look at the context of what needed to be done to deal with the FY 15, 16, 17, and 18 contracts, you can see uh, that progress, that we're down to uh, what's being submitted uh, on July 1. Uh, 
Uh, there are 22 contracts that are at risk for July 1 submission because of issues that involve uh, certificates of occupancy issues in those shelters, uh, corrective action plan issues in those shelters, uh, or other uh, issues with respect to operations, and we will submit those as soon as those issues are resolved. Uh, of the 164 contracts for FY19 that do not require any registration, 17% uh, already have active budgets, 32% uh, are pending provider submission or resubmission of budgets, and 51% are uh, in our processing process. So uh, I ran a not-for-profit. I know how challenging it is to uh, uh, operate this. I think what you see here is um, a partnership between the not-for-profits and the agency to address a number of years of challenges. Uh, and going into a new fis fiscal year with a very different uh, uh, process. That's contracting. Let's do payment. So for the Department of Homeless Services, there are currently 203 uh, invoices under review by the agency. 189 of them have been with the agency for less than 15 days. 30 days is sort of a standard aging concept. Uh, 11 have been with the agency between 16 and 30 days, and three have been with the agency greater than 30 days. At the same time, there are 79 payment tasks, meaning already uh, invoices that have already been authorized for payment. 95% uh, of them age for less than 30 days in terms of payment. So we did contracting, we did payment, and then the third process is model budget. I think that Frequently, model budget is described as a proxy for contracting, payment, and rate reform. It's really about rate reform. Uh, having said that, I just want to emphasize something I said a minute ago, which is we couldn't be doing, uh, making progress in these three areas without the not-for-profit partners. We couldn't be uh, clearing out this uh, challenge of past uh, contract registration issues. Uh, we couldn't be uh, getting invoices and processing them timely, and we couldn't be uh, this far along in a sea change in how we do rates for providers without having uh, that partnership. And I think going forward, the change in new needs that will allow a provider to draw down a, uh, a maintenance new need for a boiler that goes out in the middle of the year will be a very different process than people have experienced in the past. They experienced the process in which they had to submit a new need, they're dealing with putting out the money to get the boiler going and all of that, and we've created a way to draw down funds without having to go through that amendment process. So again, I'm very sympathetic to the challenges, and I think we're trying to present to you a transparent uh, picture of the problems that have existed, uh, that we found during the NIA review, how we're tackling them, and where we are in terms of status of, of addressing them. Um, I just want to acknowledge some of my colleagues that have joined us, uh, Council Members Yeager, Traeger, Ayala, and Gibson. Um, I just have one other thing, and I'm going to turn it over to Chair Levin. Um, to remind, uh, remind me, how much funding was dedicated from DHS to the model budget, and how was the amount, how was that amount determined? There are a number of invest. There are a number of investments. I just want to make sure I get them all right. Thank you. Uh, so let me ju just go through them, and then we can go. We can answer your question a little more granularly. So, uh, rate reform model budget, one hundred and forty-six million dollars. Uh, mental health services and shelters uh, for families with children and single adults through the Thrive Plan, $34 million. Adult shelter programmatic and literacy enhancements, $9 million. Additional security at mental health shelters, $17 million. Funding for non-capital shelter maintenance and repair costs, $5 million. FY16, 17, COLAs, $9 million for shelters. Uh, uh, FY18 COLA, $5.1 million for shelters. Uh, indirect rate increase, uh, $5.7 million. Uh, the total of all of that investment is $236 million, so about a quarter of a billion dollars. Uh, 
each of these elements were determined uh, through a process with uh, OMB and then an iterative process with the providers. And as I said, the new shelters are coming in at the model uh, and we've been able to bring uh, a significant number of the shelters in that first quartile that was most uh, off of the model uh, to conclusion within the model budget negotiation uh, process. What we, what, what, you know, a little more granularly, we did an analysis of current versus new needs, uh, and that helped us determine what kinds of ratios would be appropriate and what the new needs were that had built up. Because when I, you know, did the 90-year review and met with providers, some of them said we had given up support, uh, submitting new needs because going back for many, many years, they had been denied. Uh, and we encouraged people to submit new needs, and we used that to help us track what the gap was between where uh, where we were when we began the NIDA review uh, and where we got to with the model budget process. Okay. I have a whole bunch of stuff I'll get into, but I, I want to uh, hand it over to uh, my co-chair, Steve Levin. Thank you very much, Chair Brennan. Uh, thanks, Commissioner. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep my questions pretty limited. Um, there's a lot of a lot of questions on our on our staff question list. There's like, there's almost seventy questions on this list. So uh, this is my fourth hearing in the last four right. months. So okay. I'm I'm here. Um, <laughs> okay, big picture. At the beginning of this exercise for model budgets, uh, what was the the date that we wanted to to be done with this process by? In terms of when, when did we want all of the contracts registered with the controller funds? flowing to the not-for-profit? Uh, your question uh, takes me back to uh, where I was during the 90-day review. Mm -hmm. And it was at the time we articulated that we wanted to do a model budget process, uh, the idea that there were 1,100 uh, other contract actions that needed to be dealt with uh, was not a factor in considering how quickly we wanted to do the model budget process. So I think I've been pretty transparent in, in talking to this committee at prior hearings that we certainly prioritized addressing, cleaning up uh, accumulated problems with contracts. Mm -hmm. uh, we prioritized trying to provide uh, new needs as we went along. Uh, and uh, we then moved into the model budget phase uh, at the beginning of fiscal 17. So, okay. I'm sorry, beginning of fiscal 18. 18. So okay. we, we knew we had the funds to do it at the beginning, uh, and our hope was that we might have come to a conclusion uh, by the end of this fiscal year. Mm -hmm. But Meaning the end of this month. Uh, correct. But yeah. having an iterative process mm -hmm. in which we could uh, take input, in which we could have a back and forth process, in which we gave the provider space to submit uh, uh, proposal, submit their templates, uh, rather than being in the way that I experienced it when I was a not-for-profit head, which is get it in by Friday or, you know, that's it. Uh, we created a process that we thought was a better process than, mm -hmm. uh, than uh, simply saying, well, we're going to do it by June 30th, and therefore for we have to drive everything to that deadline. But at the same time, in terms of the stress on the provider community and stress on the agency, c addressing the contract issues that have built up over a number of years was certainly prioritized and has used a lot of the energy of mm -hmm. both the providers and the agency. Okay. Um, what is the new date that we expect these to all be done? I think we. I think it really is dependent upon each individual process. As I said before, we've got uh, about a third of the uh, uh, providers that are still working on uh, templates. I think it's appropriate to give them the room to do that. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to set an artificial deadline that then forces us to change it in the event that we give people more room for back and forth with us. We're committed to getting it done in the fiscal year that begins on July 1. We have the funds available, and we're ready to, to move forward. Uh, and we, we're, we're working our way quartile by quartile for those that are most uh, off the mark to those that uh, are least off the mark. Okay. But I will say that it's, uh, you know, from where I sit, it, it, um, it appears that the process is, is behind schedule, you know, at least six months and maybe even a year behind schedule. Seeing how long things take, um, the process began at the beginning of, of FY18. 
Um, we're now at the beginning of FY19. It's been a, been a year so far, and we're, we only have, there's no, how many, how many uh, providers are actually receiving the new funds, new rates under the model budget? Well, remember that a number of the pieces that I went through, providers have already actually gotten. The 146 million specifically for rate reform yeah. uh, is, uh, the, like I said, the first 17, the, all, the 13 shelters that are operating have the model budget uh, dollars. The 17 that were in the first quartile are ready to make their way down to the controller. So we're working. So they're not at the controller yet, and then it's another 30 days or so at the controller. The, that's correct, but okay. the controller has been very expedited in giving a review to many of these. Okay, but, but so they're not. But, I mean, nobody's at, at this point. Nobody's receiving the new rates yet. Right. There's, there. I mean, I appreciate that it's in the process, and there are some that not, are close. But just not, to be clear, nobody's actually not, getting not the it, new rates yet. Not, not correct. Okay. All 13 shelters that are operating have the new rates. The, the new, new shelters. The new shelters. Right. There are the other providers, mm -hmm. as they negotiated new needs with us, got the benefit of the model budget as we negotiated new needs. Are new needs being funded outside of the model budget process? No, but we took a look while we were negotiating. It didn't make sense to have a, you know, a piecemeal process. So where we could, and it was not in all cases, mm -hmm. but where we could, uh, we tried to make adjustments, but we're but not nobody's getting a new needs funded. If, in other words, like so, if if a, a program is in the fourth quartile, realistically can't expect to be addressed till maybe second or third quarter of FY19, and they have new needs, they can't get those new needs approved until their model budget is. Approved. No, we can address new needs as, as they arise, depending on what the new need is. Some okay. needs are urgent and some needs are, are less urgent. But the point I want to make b before to you mm -hmm. is out of the $236 million investment that we've made in, in not-for-profits, things like uh, Thrive, so the social workers, that has been rolled out. Things like the investment in uh, programming and literacy and uh, enhancements to tune in $9 million has been rolled out. Uh, security at mental health shelters has been rolled out. So again, that's why I wanted to be careful in the questions that to the extent that model budgets are described as everything that we're doing to increase investments in the not-for-profit sector and seen as everything that we're doing to address uh, historic contracting challenges, that would not, that is not the right uh, uh, perception to have. Okay. Is salary parity an objective of the model budget process uh, in the DHS, in the DHS model budget process? I mean, the salary parity between agencies, um, so that there's, um, so that entry level is, you know, between the the forty, how many forty, forty six, forty six providers that there's, that there's parity across the system, and then I have kind of a follow up around this. Uh, you know, we're we're very much focused on, um, you know, making sure that we've got the basics of operation covered and the ratios of staffing covered. Um, there are a lot of issues in the not-for-profit community that, uh, again, have built up over many years. The model budget was very much focused on dealing with inequity between one shelter or another. Mm -hmm. And what I found in the night air review, which I think you've heard about at other hearings, is if a shelter opened in the late 1980s or late 1990s, they might be getting the same rate versus a shelter that opened, uh, you know, more recently was getting a different rate. Mm -hmm. And uh, differences in the populations being served might not have been taken into account. So we we're very much focused on a systemic reform to right size the funding among different populations. Larger issues about not-for-profit resiliency uh, are part of a much larger city uh, discussion. The indirect rate change that we made came right out of that larger discussion and it, yeah. and it informed our process. Okay. Um, particularly with salary parity. So if, if we're, if, if, if model budget is uh, addressing, or this exercise is addressing minimum wage increases, and so uh, that will That's increase. True. That's true. Um, however, you then have, uh, uh, there will be something of a bottleneck uh, when it comes to compensation between um, different staff lines. And so supervisors then, if they're not getting a commensurate increase, uh, from from entry level staff, if entry level staff was under under minimum wage, now that staff 
line gets increased to meet minimum wage standards, there's not a commensurate, I don't believe there's a commensurate increase as part of model budget for supervisors. And so you do have a situation now where um, uh, you're, not, you're not seeing that, that uh, salary increase go for other level staff members. I mean, what we've found is that there's not, that there's a relatively minimal uh, minimum wage impact in terms of the changes that we've been making, that we've mm -hmm. seen so far that we need to make. So I understand your question, right. but it assumes underneath it that there's a sort of a system-wide minimum wage adjustment that's being made, and therefore there's a system-wide challenge created by that. That's actually not the facts that we're seeing across okay. the system. We are hearing from providers that the issue of salary parity is a serious issue. I, I didn't that, answer that question. Yeah, I, so. I answered only the question about minimum wage, which is the impact of, oh. of the minimum wage. And what, what I want to say for, for, for clarity for this record is the minimum wage adjustments have has not been a systemic uh, problem. It's been a challenge at, a, at uh, some number of shelters, mm -hmm. and we're dealing with that through the process. Mm -hmm. uh, the question you're asking me is, is there systemic compression of wages caused by minimum wage adjustments? And what I'm saying to you is in what we have seen, we're not seeing that because we're not seeing a systemic minimum wage uh, uh, mm -hmm. problem so far. Okay. Going back to the other question, though, is we, I mean, we're hearing it from providers that the issue around salary parity across the system, uh, I mean, salary is not really adjust. I mean, is, is I, salary adjustments is not is not addressed through this model budget process. So I appreciate, I, you know, kind of referring it over to the uh, nonprofit resiliency task force, but that, you know, I want to make sure that it's then addressed there if it's so not being addressed here. Again, I want to level set for all of us. Uh, we. I think we're the first ones out of the gate saying there should be a model budget process. Mm -hmm. And we did it for a reason, to address years of disinvestment. And we've done it deliberately to try to get it, to make sure we get it right. Uh, and there are larger citywide not-for-profit issues that are part of a conversation. Again, I come out of that community, mm -hmm. very committed to that community. I understand mm -hmm. what the challenges are. I also want to say I hope when you're getting reports that there are issues around salary uh, compression, that you're also getting reports that in the meetings we've been saying uh, as providers have highlighted these issues, we've been saying, come back with documentation so we can understand what it is we can do about it. Mm -hmm. So you're raising a, a, an issue which we mm -hmm. have, have not been dismissive about in the discussions, don't have a solution for it. We've asked for documentation so we could understand how to, how to deal with it, okay. if, uh, we, if we can. Fringe. Yep. Okay, so my understanding is fringe is also not addressed in model budget. Fringe rate, though, is set at 26% in this model budget. Um, I've heard from not-for-profits, uh, Human Services Council in general, and individual not-for-profits that I've asked what their fringe rate is. And, you know, on average, it's over 30%. And, and Human Services Council, I think, has it at 37%. I mean, I don't know when we want to get into what the city's fringe rate is, which is, like, closer to 50%. But how is it not for profit? I mean, for one thing, where are we? How are we arriving at twenty six percent? If if uh, if we're hearing from the industry itself that it's closer to 37 percent, and um, and how do we expect not for profits to make up the difference of you know eleven percent in their fringe rate? Look, I mean, the administration, as you know, has invested a lot in the sector in an unprecedented way, and a lot of progress has been made. Uh, you know, we've invested in wage adjustments and direct rate model budgets, and we're tackling issues uh, in, in, at, at a time. Uh, these are citywide commitments that you're asking about. And it's not just a one agency issue, and no, it's going to continue no, to be continue to be. No, it's not just a one city agency issue. No, no, that's what I'm saying. It's across uh, across the board, not for profits. And it's, it's, an, it's an issue that we're going to continue to look at in the same way that when we started this process. There were issues about wage adjustments, there were issues about indirect rates, and there were issues about model budgets. We're, we're addressing years of a problem that I personally experienced acutely, and we're making uh, significant progress in doing that. Doesn't mean there are pr still problems. But as I said, what we I've heard is that not for profits have to make up their that difference through private fundraising in order to make up the difference just for basic fringe. Benefits, which you know, that's your health insurance. Yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. You, you also um, know that when I testified at my budget hearing, there was tremendous consternation expressed about the uh, investments being made in our budget. 
So no, we, no, no, I, right. if, I could, if I could just finish, okay. we have to have a little consistency between hearings. In one hearing, there was a lot of focus in which that people want to know what were we investing in and that why was our budget so big. And I said we had put a billion, a quarter of a billion do dollars almost into the not-for-profit community. We'd invest $155 million into legal services. And I could go on and on with priorities that the administration and the council share. And we're working with you to make changes. Understood. All I asked I was where the money was going. I mean, right. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't raise a stink uh, about about uh, about uh, about the investments themselves. I just think, I mean, frankly, I mean, we just it's 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 simple math. We have to be able to keep up with the with the real fringe rate that not for profits are facing. We can't, I, we, we can't do the work. I ourselves. I hear we don't want to do the work ourselves. I hear what you're saying. We can't. We can't do it for under 20, 48 percent. On the fringe rate, we can we we if, if if we're such a signing example, like let us get our fringe rate down to twenty six percent. We can't do that. I think you would have um, uh, a number of important constituents if you wanted to reduce the city fringe rate, uh, uh, as you're suggesting. No, no, I, I'm just saying I'm saying that we can't. Even if we tried, we couldn't. Bec same same goes for not for profits. They can't pay a twenty six percent fringe rate. I, I hear what you're saying, uh, Chair. They can't make it. I hear what you're saying, but with respect, we have put in, a, in place a pretty unprecedented process to deal with the, if I could finish before you interrupt okay. me, uh, we put in place a, a pretty unprecedented process to deal with the years of disinvestment in the sector, and I have said a number of times in this testimony that we're going to continue to look and see what additional progress we can make. Okay. In the meantime, I mean, so for one thing, I don't even know who's, where is fringe rate going to be addressed? Is it going to be addressed in the Not-for-Profit Resiliency Task Force? The city administration tackled, has been tackling issues in sequence. The resolution of the indirect rate issue came out of that Not-for-Profit Resiliency uh, process, and that enabled us to make the changes that we're making in the model budget process. And we're going to continue to look at other changes that we can make where that's feasible. Okay, maybe it's a question for Mox because because it, it's beyond DHS, right? This is a question for all the human service sector across the agencies. We we I mean I'm out in three and a half years. So is this administration? We we can't we have to do this before before we leave. I mean we can't we can't hand it off to our successors that. They're going to have to deal with, you know, at that time, you know, in three and a half years, the fringe rate's going to be 40%. Uh, we're going to be paying at 26. And th three years after that, it's going to be 44%. We're going to be paying at 26. Right. You know, and so at a certain point, I mean, it's just, it, it, you know, the not-for-profits, you know, there's a, it, it's, it, they're, they're facing insolvency. They, they, have, they have liabilities. We don't want to cut back on <coughs> health insurance for people that are working in the not-for-profit sector. I, I hear what you're saying, uh, Chair, and I've, I've given you the best response I can give you today. Okay. Uh, and I think you've seen in over the course of now four and a half years, starting with one agency, now with a second agency, mm -hmm. changes that you and I have wanted to happen for years, yep. and we're going to keep making changes that you and I have wanted to happen for years. Great. Okay. I'm going to just ask a few questions. The, contr the state controller report mm -hmm. from last year uh, has... Um, some very concrete suggestions, um, and so I want to ask, because there are also some timelines associated with them, so I'm going to ask a few questions about the controller report. Um, uh, one of their key recommendations was establishing a standard operating procedure for shelter contract procurement and rate setting process. Um, <clears throat> the recommendation was that DHS create, maintain, and implement DHS-specific standard operating procedures the shelter contract procurement and rate setting process, as well as a standard, a standard rate guidelines for negotiating provider, provider benefits. DHS re responded that the model budget tools provide guidelines for rate setting and a structured template to guide negotiations. Further, the Office of Contracts is working on a plan to not only formally expand current standard operating procedures to DHS contracts, but to update the standard operating procedures to take into account changes in procurement law, changes in systems, and the differences in shelter contracts. Um, a consultant uh, has been hired to assist in this process, which was expected to be completed in December, December 31st of 2017. 
has that process been completed in accordance with uh, and explain to us a little bit about your the working relationship right now with uh, the offices the state controller's office um, I thought the consent re uh, report uh, controls report was constructive the state uh, controls report described at length uh, two important facts mm -hmm. uh, one was that they were auditing a process uh, that we had publicly said needed to be reformed. It was sort of like they're auditing uh, the fire department while the fire, why the fire department was putting the fire out. Mm -hmm. And they acknowledged that. Mm -hmm. And we said, come on in and give us any recommendations to see whether or not uh, their recommendations would be, uh, uh, would help us as we were making reforms. So this was, some, this was a process in which um, while they acknowledged that there was a 90-day review that had been committed, that conducted, that we had said we were integrating the two agencies to address a number of these problems, and that we were in the process of doing that, we had just effected, effectuated the civil service integration of the agencies in January uh, 2017. Uh, they were conducting the audit, and we welcomed it, and it was very helpful. Uh, the bulk of the recommendations that were made with regard to standard operating procedures and budgeting were essentially the model budget tool. And the model budget tool was completed after the audit had been completed and we provided it to them and they acknowledged that they now had it but the audit had already been completed. Now, we developed the tool in part as a result of the back and forth with providers and OMB uh, and we thought it was important to get that input and complete that input rather than rush to finish the model budget tool while the audit was going on. Mm -hmm. We think we got a better uh, model budget tool as a result of the input we got from the providers and we think ultimately uh, that we were helped by the kind of recommendations that the controller made because the state controller's recommendations were literally what we were doing. Um, we, w uh, we, we, ch we met the, the things we committed to do. Uh, there's a extensive uh, corrective action plan that we put together that's in the report uh, that is um, uh, that is really centered around the model budget process. I can certainly uh, get to you, uh, you know, w w which w which which items were hit by which dates as a, on a separate matter. But we developed a cap specifically because we knew we were going to be completed with this, with the model budget, and the controller, state controller, acknowledged that in the process. Um, okay, this, the controller's report spoke uh, extensively about uh, better data, data anal uh, analysis and usability and data integration between the systems, uh, between HHS Accelerator, APT, and CARES. Um, there was, uh, I, I believe DHS agreed that um, there would be um, a further integration of those um, systems to be launched by next week. June 30th, uh, 2018 was the deadline. Um, I can quote the controller's report on that. Um, what's the status on that process? So, so that involves integrating uh, a agency process with an external process, uh, and I can certainly give you an update on the completion of it. I think, as you know, uh, implementing IT projects uh, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes take longer than is projected, and I want to make sure that I give you the information that our um, agency gives, uh, gives the state on these matters. But this is literally integrating something that we do in-house with something that's not within our agency. We thought it was a good recommendation, uh, and we're focused on, on uh, achieving that. That would help us save time in terms of information that is, implement, that is um, input into an external system uh, to be, uh, make use of information we've already put into an internal system at the agency. Because that's a it's a it's a serious issue because um, as you're uh, looking for data, I mean, it, it, in terms of even the model budget process, I imagine that would be uh, very useful to be able to to coordinate the different um, the different systems as it currently is. I mean, as the, they they described it, I mean, they said currently there's no assurance that practices were applied consistently across contract proposals received from providers that all steps in the procurement process were followed most notably regarding contract negotiations and that the rates granted were, the DHS granted were reasonable. Um, furthermore, we found that the four computer systems the DHS uses to manage shelter-related data are not integrated. Um, and they go on to say that it's, it's very difficult then to, um, to even find, um, to match uh, uh, 
contracts and providers across the board because the, the systems themselves don't don't work with each other. Uh, I think one of the pieces of information that was critical in that was in our, our response uh, back and forth with the controller is that once you have the model budget process, the OMB review of the budgets determines whether or not the budgets are consistent. And the problem was for decades having the absence of a model budget process, you couldn't tell between uh, you know, a shelter for single adults and a, and a shelter for families with children uh, whether there was consistency in the rates. But once you have the model in place, the OMB as our oversight is reviewing whether or not the contract negotiation process was conducted consistent with the model budget. So the model budget change is the breakthrough that really addresses the problem. Um, and the documentation that is required behind the model budget process, for example, as to rent mm -hmm. and other items like that, those, those are in place already. Uh, and so I don't, want you, I don't want you to be left with the impression about whether or not the connection to the external accelerator system from DHS is the, uh, is the, is the essential <laughs> change that needed to happen based upon the controller's uh, recommendations and the corrective action plan that we put in place. The essential change that was needed was to have a model budget process with documentation for each budget so that the Office of Management and Budget could have something to evaluate from the agency uh, going forward, and that's what's been done through the model budget process. Anytime a budget is approved now through OMB, it requires uh, the, the process that we set in place with the model budgets, which address the controller's recommendations, which were very helpful. Um, they also mentioned just uh, keeping um, documentation of negotiations. Um, yeah, that, that's been done, and that was, uh, again, I want to say that they, they evaluated a system that hadn't yet been reformed. And so under the current, so, under, correct. So, so basically under your current model budget negotiations, all of those negotiations are going to be documented. Are, they are documented. Remember we've opened 13 shelters based upon it. Mm -hmm. We've got already 100% of the Remember providers in the process. Okay. I mean, I just, it just in the past, DHS has had contracts that they haven't been. So excuse me? Well, in, I the past, in the past, according to the controller's report, there's been there's been negotiations that have not been well documented. Yes, but I, I would ask that you that you remember what I just said. Yeah. The controller audited a situation before we put in place the process that I described. Therefore, I, the, I'm saying it, is that the I, process that we described has a model budget construct. Yeah, it has required documentation, actual documentation, and it has a requirement to document it. That didn't exist before we did the 90-day review and all the things that, that followed thereafter. Okay, I, I just, the way that you presented it was, since there is a model budget process, therefore the documentation of the negotiations will be, com will be comprehensive. And I'm just saying that those things you, might, I, I, you know, they're not, uh, one does not necessitate the other. So I just want to make sure that that is happening and it will happen. Fair, fair, just to be clear, the model budget process has embedded within it a shelter type, shelter size, uh, budget construct that requires actual documentation and requires documentation of the negotiations as part of the OMB oversight of the contracting process. Okay, so then before I turn it over to my colleagues, I just want to leave you with this. This is from the controller's report showing variation in rates between similar contracts. And that's this is the, this is. But this council is member, a, I've said I've said a number of times in the hearing that they audited a situation that we had yeah, we I, said publicly during the 90-day review was a I'm problem. A, I'm going to ask a prospective it. question. Fair enough. The prospective question is: Here's an instance where there are two what they deem to be similar contracts with a differentiation of 218 percent. I am going to implore, and I assume that. As a result of this model budget process, we will not see a deviation of 218 percent between shelter providers of similar contracts. That is absolutely correct. Okay, that's all. Um, okay, I'm just one other thing. I just want to. I, I, I would like Mox to speak to the fringe issue before the end of this hearing because I think it's important that I'm I'm a little confused. Mox is the contracting agency for the City of New York. 
Mox, sh I'm, I'm a little bit confused as to what role Mox has. I know, I know you said Mox doesn't have, what, what Mox isn't, doesn't have a role. I just want to know, what role does Mox have in the overall model budgeting process? Are you the ombudsman? Are you the kind of overall overseer of all of this? Are you the guarantor of standard operating procedures? Um, equity across the board. What what does Moxie as their role in this multi agency um, multi agency uh, model budgeting process? We don't have a role in the model budget process. Um, it's really truly between the agency, the provider, and OMB that's negotiating the budget. We we don't have a role in it. And with fringe rates, is there, I mean, this is a, how, how is fringe, I mean, I'm just, I, I realize that fringe will be addressed, all right, or it should be addressed, or everybody acknowledges it needs to be addressed. How is it going to be addressed? So if we can't answer when, uh, maybe we can answer how. So that's for OMB, right? Um, it's not a MOX question, okay. the fringe rate. Um, it's an OMB question. Um, you know, I, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's not part of the mock in the mox wheelhouse. Okay. Of activities. Okay. No, we'll follow up with OMB. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, turning back over to my co-chair for council member of questions. Thank you, co-chair. I also want to acknowledge we've been joined by. Council members Gradenchik, Rosenthal, and Reynoso. Um, and I want to turn it over to my colleagues, but I think I have, uh, Commissioner Banks, I have no doubt that in an undisclosed location in Montana, they're trying to clone you. Um, however, I, I, think hope I, have, not. I think I can actually prove that's happening. But, um, you know, every agency doesn't have a Commissioner Bank. So I know today, I and mean, we have a stack of of, I mean, you know, all these folks that are going to testify who are going to be singing a very different song than, than your song. Um, and I think the acknowledgement of the pain is, is a big deal. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, that we've, we're trying to turn over a new leaf and, and head forward here. But the, 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 old, the reason that we even decided to have this hearing was based on not a personal crusade from either of the co-chairs here, but of what we were hearing from providers, you know? So I think for us, it's just, if we are heading a new direction and things are gonna, things are gonna, you know, get better, you know, and we gotta give it time, I get all that, but the pain is very real. And as, as a couple of months ago, we have, you know, providers saying, look, you know, there was a contract to provide peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for a million dollars, and it actually costs us $3 million, you know? So, um, you know, so it's, it's, it's a real thing. It's a no, real thing. I, again, I, I certainly understand the problem from several different perspectives. Uh, remember that when the mayor asked me to conduct the NIA review, it was my finding that there had been years of underinvestment, and it was my testimony about an hour ago that that underinvestment made it very difficult to provide the kind of services that our agency needs to provide. So. Don't mistake my uh, testimony for uh, the progress that we're continuing to make, that we haven't been down a very uh, uh, difficult road for not-for-profits and for the agency. Um, I understand and, and I appreciate the focus of the committee overall as well as the General Welfare Committee focus is broader than, than my agency uh, or agencies. Uh, but I do think that some of the things that we've done are, are were done because the administration overall wanted to uh, make some changes and we were willing to make those changes and now ACS is, is joined in that. We added APS at HRA and I think that there are lessons that are important to learn. I think that uh, the issue that you're raising about the provider that's got to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and they don't have enough money to do it is um, is a challenge, uh, and we are trying to address the challenge with our shelter providers and our APS providers through a very uh, deliberate process. The APS one went very quickly, relatively speaking, because it was a pretty pretty straightforward uh, problem that we we're solving for. DHS 
years of challenges, much bigger problem required dealing with the contract issue. But you know, the reason why we are current now uh, with our invoices and our payment of receivables is because the people you know, around me who are here um, and have put a tremendous amount of work into trying to alleviate as much pain as possible to pay invoices uh, on time and to be in a position where I can give you that data. And the completion of all those contracts was extremely painful for every one of the not-for-profit providers. But to get to a place where we're moving away from that is really a lot, a lot of hard work at the agency as a priority because we value not-for-profit providers. And uh, you know, I, I can only give the answers that I can testify to hearing that are truthful based upon what we're doing. So I can give you the answer that we've made progress on indirect, we've made progress on uh, wages, we've made progress on model budgets and these other service enhancements, and that fringe is an issue that, that I is not um, currently addressed, but I understand how serious it is. Thank you. Okay, I want to turn it over to my colleagues now for questions, um, starting with Council Member Torres, followed by Gibson, Rosenthal, and Barron. Council Member Torres. How are you, Commissioner? Goodness I'd rather have you here than an undisclosed location in Montana, but <laughs> there are some other people I would rather have in an undisclosed. Okay. Um, Council, and Council no I I'm very much value that comment. <laughs> uh, and no matter what concerns I have, I, I unfailingly appreciate you and the work you do. Um, I have a question about uh, a daily news article about a month ago about contracted security in the privately run shelters. Uh, the article claims that the competition for security subcontracts is fundamentally lacking, as is the city's oversight of those security subcontracts. So the city will contract with a not-for-profit to run the shelter, and then the not-for-profit will then subcontract with a security firm to handle the security. And the article suggests that, I think it provides a snapshot of, of the contracted, the budget for contracted security in January of 2017, and it seems to indicate that the security of our shelter system is essentially in the hands of a duopoly, that there are two firms that control 86% of the budget for contracted security out of 14 vendors. So one of them is FJC, which received 26 million, and Sierra Security Services, which received 13 million, and that's 39 million out of a $46 million budget in January of 2017. The article then claims that these vendors were accused of violence through lawsuits, incident reports. Uh, I guess what is the nature and extent of the city's oversight over these, what appears to be a wild, wild west of security subcontracting? So can I, uh, can I try to address that question in, in parts? And, and if I don't get to a piece of it in my answer, please come back to me, because I, I believe I can answer what you're asking me. OK. So I'm going to try to um, go big picture. I think that, that that would be a helpful way to do it. So there are a number of pieces that that came through that that reporting, and one piece was, uh, I think, approximately 21 lawsuits uh, against different private security entities going back over a period of time, um, and that was an aspect of of the reporting. Uh, and there was one horrific incident that was, in particular, um, I think it was a link to a video. Yes. Particularly horrific incident. And I think how that was handled gives a, gives a picture of our going forward world because um, almost all of those incidents uh, were before the NYPD oversight team uh, that were reported on, but that one was one that was after the NYPD oversight team. And so the provider immediately reported it through our reporting of such things. The NYPD immediately looked into it and the uh, guard who's involved was, uh, we, were, we demanded that that guard be immediately terminated uh, and uh, that the supervisor, if they weren't going to terminate the supervisor, the supervisor would be removed from providing any services on any contract having anything to do with our agency. And that was the response, that will be the response going forward to anything of that nature uh, because I think we've got a different um, security operation at the agency than we used to have. In terms of the oversight issue, which is another oh, aspect. Although, if I can just quickly sure, interject, sure, it sure. was noted in the article that your agency neglected to inform DOI of the incident. And the article 
suggest that you were required to do so. Right, and, and we, are, we, we don't believe we are. We provide a tremendous amount of reporting to DOI. I think that the Commissioner Peters has testified about a good working relationship we have with DOI, particularly in rooting out fraud uh, together, and we've done a lot of very important work together. Um, in that particular instance, it was an individual incident we, we viewed it as, as opposed to a, a problem uh, that was systemic in nature. So we made the judgment, uh, and we make that judgment all, uh, that, uh, and it's been a judgment that's been um, embraced, that that wasn't a situation. We do report a lot of other things uh, that we have <coughs> concerns about the DOI on a regular basis. For example, uh, to go to a different area, uh, uh, theft of our benefits yeah. by our staff. Uh, that comes as a, in, in large part the, the terrific investigations the DOI has done. It comes in large Just part in the interest of time, I don't want to dwell on this, but you were, you were, you were about to answer about oversight. Sure. Uh, but just on that DOI question, we, we don't agree with the characterization okay. of the report, and uh, we have a very good working relationship with DOI, and I think we probably... And, and Commissioner Peters has said as much. So I, 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 I think we over-report, yeah. so we didn't... didn't, sure. we didn't I, I don't think he'll agree with that, but yeah. <laughs> um, but we're going to keep over-reporting. The issue of oversight, uh, we think, in terms of the model budget process, you can see that we put more money into shelter security through the percentages of the in the model budgets for these first groups. So we're increasing the expenditures, which we think uh, will help address some of the issues with respect to is there enough uh, security in place. And then the NYPD has oversight of how we're doing system-wide. They have a management team uh, that is, you know, taking up almost a whole f part of a floor uh, that is regularly reviewing uh, how our security operations uh, proceed. And uh, does that include the security operations of the private yes. contractors? Yes, and I, that is actually I was just thinking about okay. to make that point. I think there's a misperception that they're only focused on the peace officers who are directly employed by DHS, but they have a broader perspective. Uh, and so uh, the NYPD is evaluating security deployment in each of the 13 shelters that we operate. Do we, before a non-for-profit is able to select a security firm as a subcontractor, does DHS or the NYPD conduct a background check? Uh, that's an issue that we're looking at. I was okay. going to say, so breaking into pieces, one is the NYPD role in that particular incident, I think, shows you what we will be doing going forward as a result of this relationship with the NYPD. Item two is we put more money into, the, into security. I think that'll help. Item three, we're looking at going forward exactly the kind of issue you're raising. So at, at the moment, there is no background check on security firms that are entrusted with the safety of families and children. <laughs> It, at, th at the moment, and I want to make sure I'm giving you the right answer because it's, it's, uh, it's an important to focus on here. At the moment, we have our providers that have vendors that work with them, uh, and we ourselves look at vendors as problems arise, and one of the things that this particular problem has presented to us is are there other things that we can do to address right. this right. particular problem And we were looking? I guess, but my concern is, in Understood. addition to reacting Understood. to problems as they arise, are we proactively yeah. conducting I meant problem. background? Uh, yeah, I meant problem not as an individual problem. I yeah. meant problem as an, as an area of uh, making sure that we're, our services are as tight as they should be. Uh, and I will look forward to talking to you in particular about yeah. changes that we may make in that area. Are, are, are the private the not-for-profits that are running these shelters, are those not-for-profits bound by the same procurement rules that would apply to the city? Like, is it a competitive bidding process? I want to understand why there are two companies that control 86% of the market. So. I mean, there are different things that they have to bid out that are competitive. Is that one of them? Hang on a sec. They have to have three bids for things that they bid on like that. Okay, and have we investigated why there's these two firms have such an outsized I think it's an influence over the market? I think it's a market issue that the questions you're asking me, we're looking at to see what, how we might address some right. of those issues. Like the but differences are astonishing. One is at well over 20 million, one is at 14 million, everyone else is below 2 million. Right. <laughs> I think it's a market issue. Yeah. Um, I should say, and I think you know this, that the uh, HRA itself, as does DHS, have contracts with FJC. Uh, and we have 
pretty direct oversight of how they're performing on our contracts. Uh, the NYPD and DHS very closely manage the FJC contract uh, for our own shelters uh, and our hotels. And uh, I think we testified at the May hearing that we were uh, going to be looking at the shelter providers to uh, provide more direct oversight of uh, shelter security, and we're going to continue to report to you on how what kind of progress we're making. And just uh, just to wrap up, I like my colleagues. I just hear an endless stream of complaints about the lack of timeliness in payments, and you know my issues are twofold. One, it, it gives the impression that there's a double standard that that not for profits are honoring their end of the bargain, but we're failing to honor ours. And when a not for profit breaks the rules, there's accountability. When we break the rules, there seems to be impunity. But the second more important concern I have is that late payments have the effect of rigging the process in favor of, or against uh, community-based organizations. There are community-based organizations that simply lack the cash flow to go months or a year without payments from the city. And so I guess what actions are you taking to address that problem is there a loan program that alleviates that problem? Because I continue to hear complaints. They're as prevalent as they've ever been. So here are, I think, a couple and, things. And I'll end it there. Yeah, I think there are a couple things we could all look at together. Um, a lot of the reporting recently on uh, contract delays were actually about the discretionary contracts, which by their nature are not in place uh, at the beginning of a fiscal year because it's only, it's part of the, um, it's money that's added to the budget through the discretionary funding process. And uh, when the chair referred to the providing peanut butter and jelly, I think that there's an issue that we might all look at as to the payment issues that arise uniquely with respect to discretionary contracts because they are funded at the end of one fiscal year and then they go forward. In terms of the contracts that are part of the baseline budget. Uh, which are the contracts about which I hear complaints as well. Fair enough, yes. but a lot of the recent From report, shelter providers. Fair enough. Uh, let's just focus on that then. Uh, we've invested a lot of resources to get to the place where I just reported on today to have the number of contracts that are in house, number of invoices that are in house that are paid, that are waiting payment to be less than 30 days, is a result of a lot of hard work by both those providers yeah. and by us. And 30 days is a standard. Uh, it could be 60 days, but we've been very focused on making it 30 days and to clear up all those back contracts. And look, some of the people I know that have complained to both you and me have complained about the policy that we took, which we weren't going to register contracts until we had an effective corrective action plan in place to address shelter conditions. That's not all of them. There are other issues that, that delayed uh, those 1,100 contracts that I talked about that we have, have cleared out. Uh, but there are a lot of issues that are in effect here. We rely, as you said, we rely upon our not-for-profit partners, and that's why we've invested the resources in cleaning up that contract problem in the past and uh, moving very quickly to get contracts in place for FY19 and dealing with the invoicing problem, which is real for not-for-profits. Thank you, Commissioner. Stay away from Montana. So. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Councilmember Gibson for questions. Good afternoon. Oh, okay. Sorry, Sorry I didn't see you. I know. I'm all the way in the front. Good afternoon, Commissioner Banks, and to Chair Levin, to Chair Brandon, and to all of my colleagues. And it's good to have uh, Mox here as well. I guess the first thing I want to say is I echoed the sentiments of Chair Levin in when we talked about the fringe benefits. Certainly, uh, that conversation needs to continue. If the statewide average is higher than 26%, um, I certainly think it's something that's worthy of further conversation. And, you know, understanding the reason why the model budget has been put forward. And I really think it's important. I respect that Mox is here, but the mayor's office of management and budget should be here. OMB should really be here to answer a lot of the questions that we have, because all of the agencies that are complying with this model budget process are following the rules and guidelines of OMB. And, you know, the, the guidelines that the agency is setting forth. So um, I, I certainly suggest to my chairs that we continue this conversation and, and raise a lot of the issues that we have with OMB. Um, I wanted to ask a question because 
Commissioner Banks, I acknowledge all of the incredible work that you have done in your tenure as commissioner. Um, we've worked very closely together on behalf of my borough of the Bronx. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of work done. And certainly before I ever criticize, I always compliment <laughs> because there is a lot of work that has been done. Um, but most recently when we started having budget conversations here at the council, I've been very critical of the agency spending of the re-estimates that we've talked about, the $2 million in cluster housing every month, the $16 million in adult shelters, the millions of dollars that we invest in hotels and motels. I've been very critical because I want us as a city to practice what we preach. If we are using a model budget and we're squeezing our providers to be more efficient and we're essentially cutting their contract size, we need to do the same ourselves. And so if we're talking the talk, we have to walk the walk um, and practicing what we really are preaching. And I really want you know, the agency to recognize because I too, like my colleagues here from many providers, and I want the agency to understand the realistic needs that many of our clients have. When you're talking about shelter services, when you're talking about PS and OTPS and security and everything that goes into running a shelter. And our providers do an incredible job. Do they face challenges? Absolutely. And so I understand as the conversation continues with many providers around this model budget that we do have to make those tough decisions. But I also want us to be very realistic of some of the needs that they have. As, as Richie mentioned, a lot of the providers don't have the money to front load. They just simply need to be paid in a sufficient uh, time frame. So I wanted to ask a question, because in all that I say, I actually do have a question. Um, and in your testimony, you talked about the work that's being done working with all of the different providers as it relates to reviewing all of these contracts and templates you talked about, and core tiles I see as well. What does the team look like that actually makes the final decision on, on this model budget? Um, is there consistency at DHS in terms of the, the team, the deputy, the executive teams that make these decisions? And why I'm asking this question is because at times we're hearing from providers that they meet with one group and they're told a set of information and then they meet with another group and then they're told a different a, a level of information. So I just want to understand in terms of the reviewing team, what that looks like, and is that as consistent as it can be? Does that make sense? Uh, absolutely. Okay. The, the the team is a consistent approach. Okay. Uh, I respect complaints that are made by not for profit providers. So let's talk offline to see mm -hmm. if what sure. we what I mean. Look, we have values to be consistent. Mm -hmm. I believe we are being consistent. If there's an instance in which we haven't been consistent. Why don't you and I talk about it, and let's see if we can address that provider's uh, provider's needs. I want to just say one thing, though, in terms of your your earlier comment. One of the realities that that the model budget process shows is providing high quality traditional shelters costs more than providing uh, shelter through clusters, right. and that's one of the issues to, with why it's important to get the model budgeting right so that the services can be right. Uh, and as we get rid of and phase out the use of the clusters, which you've been a big supporter of, which I appreciate. And I still have a lot more to go. And we're halfway there in this 18-year program. We're halfway I'm there. I'm going to keep pushing. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> we're pushing ourselves too. Uh, you know, that's, that's a, a, a driver of cost because the model budget is, is a better way to compensate not-for-profits, uh, but having, um, uh, having clusters was a cheap way of providing shelter for 18 years. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So wh what can we expect moving forward in terms of the further conversations that DHS is having with shelter providers to deal with some of the challenges that we've heard from the industry? You know, what, what should we expect moving forward? Um, there's a recognition that we do have challenges. Nothing is perfect. But I do want to make sure that we leave this hearing with a real understanding that the agency is listening to the, the providers, and you've talked about you know the different task forces and, and a lot of the input that has already been received, but I really want to make sure that you're listening and you're hearing them, because at the end of the day, 
we expend millions and millions of, of dollars in contracts. They're the providers doing the work on the ground. They're serving our residents. They're serving our constituents. And, and certainly as someone who represents a lot of those locations, both single and family, it's really important for me to make sure that we get this right. Because we can really serve, as we say, a model budget. We really can be a model for other agencies in terms of how we work best together when we achieve the same common goals and priorities. I, I appreciate that. I think the three key things to look at is the uh, payment of invoices uh, and how we're doing on that. And you can see where we are in terms of uh, the under 30 day numbers. Uh, I think the uh, completing the contracting process and we're on a pace to do it in a uh, far more timely way this year than has been done in, in the past and continuing to, to focus on that is an important takeaway. And I think the third thing is the completion of the model budget process during the, this fiscal year. Um, and look, I think a lot's been talked about the process. I think the providers have been doing an extraordinary job in the process in all three of these areas, which is getting invoices in, uh, helping us address the contract problems that built up over a number of years, uh, and uh, the working with us on the model budget process. I think that they've been great partners and in doing that. We appreciate the work that they do. Um, I think the oversight agencies, OMB and MOX, and the law department have been very supportive and the controller's been supportive. I think sometimes people say, you know, well, what's going on with your registration? I think there's been a good working relationship to address uh, registration challenges too. Thank you very much. Thank you to the chairs. I look forward to working with you. Thanks. Thank you, Councilwoman Gibson. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, Raphael, Councilman Salamanca has joined us. Um, and I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Chair Levin. Um, thank you very much, Chair Brannon. Um, I know you have to leave, Commissioner, so I just have a couple more questions here. Um, what, for, for the providers that are in the second, third, fourth quartiles, um, how are they supposed to budget their FY19 um, uh, service levels? How are they supposed to do planning? Their, their FY19 starts like next week. So how are they supposed to know what their staffing levels are to be, what types of services they are to provide if they are months away from coming to agreed upon terms with DHS on their model budget. Ha, you know, it'll, they'll be pretty far into the year. What, what, what do you advise them to do at this point? Uh, I mean, I, first of all, I, I want to make sure that everybody gets uh, to us the model budget template, because that's a helpful starting place. Uh, and uh, there's a constant communications between providers and our staff. And I would encourage them to continue that. Uh, for example, if somebody, everybody now knows what the model budget um, template is because they all 100% of the providers have it, uh, and the majority have su have submitted it back to us. Uh, they, if if a particular provider knows, for example, they're out of whack with the housing specialist ratio, for example, that's certainly something that we would expect people to be raising with uh, with us to see. Uh, you know where we are in that process. I think that that the assumption is that the model budget process is this process in which it's the only method of communication between the providers uh, and the agency, and the providers are in constant contact back and forth. So you're I, advising them to 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 staff as if they were not, getting paid under not, the model budget. I did not say that, and I I know your question was you know to to push me. And when you asked the question, what well, do I advise them? And my question, my answer is as follows. Yeah. We should continue the dialogue. If you're a provider that is not getting in the template, please get it in. Uh, uh, you know, 31% uh, uh, of the providers, we, we want those templates. And that will help us move the process forward. But and you, for so the if provider, the template is in, then, they'll, then they should staff according to the I template? Did not, I did not say that. Okay. What I said was that they should be in contact with us because that's the reason why this is not a cookie cutter process. The agency ran itself for 20 years uh, with a cookie cutter process. Uh, here's what it is, you get it, take it or leave it. And we have moved away from that. And that's why it is an iterative process with every individual shelter and every individual provider, but with 
very clear outlines of what the model looks like. So we're going to continue to urge providers to be in contact with us as we move through this over the next couple of months. And how are they handling, or how is DHS handling, closing out FY18 budget years while negotiations are going on? I'm not sure I'm following you on that because 18, in terms of contract registration, uh, and the prior years, other than particular problem contracts, are done. They, we have given people letters for auditors to deal with issues like uh, in the past, before we had any of these processes, we gave letters like on pending new needs mm -hmm. uh, and other things. And one of the issues that um, we've said to you and others before is that if you have expenses, we will make retroactive payments. So we're certainly happy to work with providers to try to address those kinds of challenges in closing out uh, their fiscal year, which is over the next uh, uh, couple of weeks or months, depending on when their audit period is. So then how are new needs being handled in that context? Are they booked as receivables, or how, how is the? Again, it, it, each provider, I don't want to I don't want to say, here's how it's going to be handled, if in a particular provider's case, that's not the right way to handle it. I might have misunderstood your term closeout. I think of this from a not-for-profit perspective. Mm -hmm. There's the closeout of your year for your not-for-profit audit. Mm -hmm. There's the closeout of your year with us. Right. Uh, okay. And I was thinking about the closeout with the not-for-profit auditor, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's important that providers be in touch with us about how to handle their closeouts with us and their closeouts with their not-for-profit auditors, which we have been doing in the past. Again, we have a universe of 46 providers. Each right. one of them has different needs depending on which site it is uh, and where they are in this process. Okay. Um, Remembering that of the sites, 13 of them have model budgets in place, 17 ha of them have uh, essentially agreed to model budgets, and we're going to continue to work expeditiously through the remaining ones. So in terms of their, so in terms of their 18 contracts, I mean, they should be in touch, and then who, they're getting in touch with their contract manager, who are they getting in touch with, and, and, and they can they expect, you know, a, uh, you know, a, a, a rapid response. And, yeah, I, and again, I, I don't want to leave an impression on the record that it's a, um, laden bureaucratic process of being in touch with the, the program staff at DHS. There's ongoing communications that go on, and this, these are the kinds of things that are part of that process. Okay. Um, and I know, because you've been very helpful in trying to help us make reforms, that if you get a call from a particular provider that says that something mm -hmm. that I said here didn't turn out to be the case, you'll, you'll tell me and we will address it. Mm -hmm. And I, I've appreciated in prior hearings that that's happened. Um, okay, just two other things really quickly here. Um, I just want to be, be clear that I'm just looking at the controls report on pages 28 and 29, and they did can I have... Just, can I just add one other point that sure. uh, um, I'm being passed, which I, I thought I had made this point, but I'll make sure it's clear for the record. New need amendments are also in process, and they're being bundled with the, with the model, uh, where that's the quickest way to do it. So, again, it's not a, it's not a um, oh, you can't talk to us about what your needs are in this year because part of that process has been ongoing with providers as well. But I want to emphasize it's not one size fits all. Mm -hmm. I've said that a lot of hearings. It really is important here. The one size fits all is what got us into that 212% difference in what the city was paying for those providers in that controller's audit. Okay. So, sorry, just to be clear then. So, new needs are being bundled into um, into the model budget process, but if they're if they're in this no, third need, or fourth quartile, how do they? How are their new needs for FY eighteen no, being no, addressed? New needs are being bundled into the contracting process. If that's the quickest way to get it done, so we could the do the contracting it. process is the model budget process. No, for their FY moving no, forward. No. no, there are three processes going on at once. One process is to make sure that we are uh, stick to the timeliness of payments. Mm -hmm. based upon when we get invoices. The second process is to deal with contract registration issues, which built up over many years. Uh, and the third process is to have a model budget so that uh, we can deal with inequities among spending and where we can get a new need done quickly through a contracting process, we'll do it. And that might 
alleviate uh, or accelerate model budget needs, and we've been doing that as, as those needs have, have arisen, which is why it's not a cookie cutter. Everybody should do it by this date. Mm -hmm. That would get us into a very bad situation. You can see, and again, I want to emphasize this, I gave you the number that of, of, uh, of um, templates that we don't have back, not to say, oh, and they're not giving us the templates. I'm actually raising that because it's a complicated process that each provider has to go through to look at what their needs are as against the template. Mm -hmm. And so forcing them to give it quickly or forcing us to do it uh, quicker than uh, the deliberative process was set in place, I think will lead to mistakes that uh, on both the not-for-profit pro providers uh, a part and our part, which is why we set up the process this way. Sorry, I just want to go back to the controller's report because I, I just sure. was a little bit unclear about... The um, state controller's report, which State controller's report, state yes. Control. Um, the recommendation about, which your recommendation uh, two, which was around creating and implementing the standard operating procedure. So it says at this time, Department of Social Services Office of Contract was integrated and all DHS program staff have been formally informed that the existing SOPs apply. Sorry, I'm sorry. Um, yes. So. Uh, with that recommendation number two, which is create and maintain, create, maintain, and implement a DHS specific standard operating procedure for the shelter contract procurement and rate setting process, as well as standard rate guidelines for negotiating provider budgets to ensure continuity in processes as DHS transitions through its integration into DSS, the, cor the agency corrective action updating existing SOPs says that the target date will be implemented 12-31-17. I just want to make sure that happened. Y yes, what I, what I was reluctant uh, to give you a yes, everything's done answer when you, uh, on our first go around on this, mm -hmm. it's a complicated cap. There are a lot of different moving parts. Uh, and I, want, I don't want to give you an overbroad, yes, everything's done on that one. Obviously, we had to do that in order to implement the model budget process. Okay. And then but there were a lot of uh, there were a lot of items that make reference to different standard operating uh, procedures, and I want to be careful uh, in uh, in getting back to you on on where all the all the items in the cap are. Okay, and then the one on system integration says will be implemented on six thirty eighteen. Um, that is that that will not be achieved on 6318. Uh, that's correct, because there are some external dependencies uh, that we have to achieve, but it is on a fast track to happen. It's okay. not a, uh, you know, it, 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 it's on a fast track to happen. Okay. Um, and, and then on, um, I'm sorry, I just, just want to make sure on, I just want to make sure that we're clear as to what the result, re the role of the not-for-profit resiliency task uh, uh, commit committee, uh, not-for-profit resiliency co committee, is on um, on implementing this process and other things that we've spoken about at this hearing, fringe rates. Um, uh, et cetera. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. uh, 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 no wages, worries. for example. So, what exactly is the role of of uh, the NRC? Yeah, sure. Happy to answer that. So, um, and let me just take a minute. Also, I want it, it dawned on me afterwards that perhaps it would be helpful to share with you a bit about what Mox is doing because yeah. I know that we don't meet with you regularly. And what NRC actually, you know, yeah. we yeah, spoke yeah. about it a little bit, but what, yeah. what what does it see as its purview? Sure, absolutely. So, let me just um, if if. Um, you don't mind, I just want to take a moment to share with you what MOX is doing. Um, and as we mentioned before, so we work with agencies and we work with the comptroller to oversee the process, the contracting process. Um, and that process is defined by responsibility and fairness. Um, but we're looking now actively, and we've um, met with Chair Brannon about it as well, to try to integrate timeliness into the process as well. And that's primarily through a technology solution called Passport, and that launched in August with its first phase, which brought Vendex online. So we're trying to digitize, <coughs> we're trying to streamline 
um, and we're trying to re-engineer the processes so that we can realize timely procurement. And it will happen over the course of several releases of this passport system. The second one's coming up, and then there'll be a third one, which will actually um, incorporate the vision of having end-to-end uh, -end procurement uh, process that's online and digitized. So that's MOX for you. Um, with respect to the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee, MOX is the manager of the NRC. It was launched by Mayor de Blasio in September 2016 uh, with the goal of bringing together the city and the human service sector uh, to open up lines of communication and to collaborate on a variety of different projects. The projects are brought to the committee by providers. We have almost 100 providers um, that are part of the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee and over 20 city agencies and mayoral offices that work together uh, to realize a variety of goals. So um, one was around cash flow and it was through the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee that we have a new policy in place as of a year ago where we have a 25% advance on all registered contracts and with recoupment happening in the second half of the cycle. We've digitized audits. What used to be a paper-based system is now one that's um, in part done digitally through Accelerator's Document Vault. We're standardizing it, creating more transparency um, and an opportunity for efficiency and an understanding across the sector on what we're looking for and how it should unfold when we're at agencies. Collaborating around program design, we have a guide now that was written in collaboration with partners um, in the nonprofit sector on how to engage better around program design. So all of these projects, there's over 20 accomplishments in 20 plus months. With respect to the specific questions around fringe and the like, we, those come into the committee, we have conversations, we identify opportunities that we can work together in order to tackle those projects. As Commissioner Banks said, indirect was brought to us um, through those recommendations, there were investments made in adopted, and we're currently working on a citywide manual to create a consistent um, approach to indirect rate that's pegged to the federal guidance. Okay. Hope that was helpful. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right, that's it for me. I'll let you guys go. Doesn't <laughs> <laughs> anything more? No. Thank you guys very much, um, and we'll talk to you soon. Great. Thank you both chairs for your focus on this issue, which is very important. For right sure. On. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, we're going to shuffle here and we're going to uh, hear from the Administration uh, for Children's Services. We're going to have uh, Commissioner Hansel, Kaylee Berger, and Jacqueline Martin, all from ACS. Welcome. <laughs> How are you?
Okay, we're just going to uh, swear you guys in. Would you all please raise your right hands? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. You may begin. Uh, members of the uh, Committees of General Welfare and Contracts, I'm David Hansel, Commissioner of the New York City Administration for Children's Services. And with me today on my right are Dr. Jacqueline Martin, Deputy Commissioner for our Division of Preventive Services, and Kaylee Berger on my left, Assistant Commissioner for Community-Based Strategies. We very much appreciate the opportunity to speak with you about ACS's model budget process for our contracted prevention services providers. Generous investments in prevention services by the de Blasio administration and by the City Council have allowed ACS to develop a quality model budget process to ensure that providers can implement the best possible service models to support families and make sure that they are appropriately compensated for doing so. And we look forward to updating you on our collaborative process. However, before I discuss our model budget process, I would first like to address two matters that have been at the forefront of our thoughts recently of utmost concern for ACS and I'm sure also of concern to the Council. First, the tragic death of five-month-old Raymond Porfield Jr. in the Bronx earlier this month pains all of us greatly. Our responsibility at ACS is to do everything in our power to protect children. There is no mandate more important. While I'm not at liberty to discuss the specifics of the case, I can tell you that we are conducting an in-depth investigation looking at all aspects of what happened. As part of our continuing reform effort, we look at all of our work critically in order to constantly strengthen both our protective and our preventive work. I look forward to discussing with the Council soon any new initiatives that stem from our review. My mandate as Commissioner is to ensure that we are continuing our aggressive reform efforts in order to protect children and support families in New York City. And I'm grateful for the Council's partnership in this mission. Second, yesterday I accompanied Mayor de Blasio to a center in East Harlem that provides services to children who have been separated from their parents at the border and brought to New York. We met with leadership and staff of the center and we observed some of the children who were there. We have all been horrified by the federal government's separation policy, and we were stunned to learn yesterday how many of these children are here in New York City. These are federal programs that are not under ACS's jurisdiction, but we are concerned about the safety and well-being of all children in New York City. The staff at Cayuga, described the depth of trauma, mental health issues, other issues and concerns that these children are experiencing. And we committed to Cayuga staff that we will provide any support they need to ensure that kids are getting what they need. The impact of the new executive order is still unclear. There is still no definitive indication that these kids will be reunited with their parents, so our concern remains. We've requested access to the two other programs in New York City uh, that are uh, handling uh, young people separated at the border. We are working very closely with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs and coordinating with our sister agencies, in particular the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the Department of Education and Health and Hospitals, to ensure that all of this city's resources are brought to bear for the children and families torn apart by this disastrous policy. I'll now turn to discussing our preventive services work and the model budget that we've developed over the last year. The goal of our prevention services is to support New York City's families in building skills to manage crises, main maintain safety and stability within the home, and strengthen their ability to thrive within their communities. A May 2017 assessment by Casey Family Programs a nationally recognized child welfare organization found that New York City leads the nation in providing evidence-based and promising practice intervention prevention programs to support families and cites New York City as, quote, a national leader in investing in the continuum of preventive services and supports, unquote. ACS has steadily increased the availability of prevention programs that are shown 
to reduce rates of maltreatment and improve overall child and family well-being. Over 20,000 families per year receive in-home support, parent coaching, trauma therapy, and other supportive services to help them cope with the mental health, domestic violence, substance abuse, parenting challenge, and other stresses that can make parenting difficult. Our vision for is for every New York City child to have the support of a strong family in a healthy community to help them succeed, and for our system of prevention programs to help provide these supports for families experiencing serious challenges. ACS could not achieve any of this without the work of our 54 contracted nonprofit provider partners, the people who do the work every day. The providers we work with are some of the best in the country, and they deliver high quality services directly to families every day. In creating a model budget, our goal was to engage in a truly collaborative and effective process to ensure that our providers have the resources they need to deliver the quality services our New York City families and children deserve. Most of ACS's contracts with prevention agencies have been in place since 2009 with minimal budget increases. By early 2017, many of our providers were facing critical staff shortages because of inadequate salaries, which reduced capacity and contributed to a service backlog. When I became commissioner in March of last year, I quickly realized that while our preventive models and our providers were outstanding, we needed to take action to shore up the infrastructure of our programs. Recognizing the fiscal challenges facing nonprofits delivering child welfare services, Mayor de Blasio and the Council allocated over $50 million in the fiscal year set 2017-18 city budget to enhance funding for prevention services contracts to make sure that they align with the cost of delivering quality services. ACS acted immediately to provide this additional funding to our prevention agencies in two phases. First, we identified specific areas in which we believe that our preventive providers needed additional resources to meet core programmatic requirements. These included support for additional family conference, conference facilitators, which is a key component of our model, and also enhanced training opportunities, which enabled us to establish for the first time baseline training requirements for all of our preventive agency case handling staff. We also added a cost of living adjustment wage increase for provider agency staff. Secondly, in the city budget for FY 2017-18, ACS received $26 million in increased funding to develop a quality model budget for prevention providers. In the summer of 2017, we began a model contract review process in close collaboration with a steering committee comprising many of our prevention providers to assess where additional resources were needed to support high quality service delivery. We worked with providers to identify needs that could be addressed within the constraints of our existing contracts and procurement rules while pursuing better outcomes for children and families. We commenced this collaborative process with a three-month listening tour in which the leadership of our Division of Prevention Services met with providers to learn about their ideas, challenges, and needs to help ensure that the process would result in meaningful solutions for our provider agencies. We then partnered with the Council of Family and Child Caring Agencies, or COFCA, with New York City Opportunity and with the New York City Office of Management and Budget to convene a steering committee with representation from a cross-section of prevention services providers to collectively develop budget enhancements and a process that would meet the needs of our diverse network of providers and which would also reflect and articulate ACS's own needs. DPS Prevention Services conducted six focus groups consisting of more than 90 prevention staff of all levels across eight provider agencies and completed extensive research and data analysis to help inform the resulting enhancements. The work of our steering committee revealed the most prominent challenges with which our prevention providers were struggling, including staff turnover, high caseloads, service utilization, and a wait list for service referrals. To target these challenges directly, ACS and the Model Budget Steering Committee developed a package of four focused budget enhancements. First, stronger supervision. To provide better management and oversight for provider agency staff, the model budget includes funding 
to reduce the supervisor to case planner staff ratio to one to four across all prevention programs with the goal of decreasing turnover of frontline staff and supervisors and increasing service utilization over time. Number two, casework support. The model budget now mandates providers to employ case aides or parent aides and provides funding for this added position. Case aides and parent aides will provide workload relief by assisting case, case planners, which will in turn help to reduce staff turnover and increase service utilization. Three, quality improvement. We firmly believe that all families should have access to quality services, and we're committed to helping our providers improve and maintain the high standard of services that have positioned New York City as a national model. To further this work, the model budget includes funding for each provider to hire a designated quality assurance, quality improvement, or a QAQI staff person to manage that QAQI work across the provider's prevention portfolio. This measure will help to improve case practice and supports collaborative quality improvement. And fourth, recruitment and retention. Finally, the model budget includes funding for much needed salary increases for case planners and supervisors. A more competitive pay scale will help to recruit qualified staff and will encourage experienced staff to remain, thereby improving overall case practice quality. Providers are given three options for implementing the allocated funds. One, increasing existing base salaries. Two, implementing incremental salary increases to help promote longevity. Or three, instituting wage differentials to help recruit staff with specialized skills or licensure. We announced the model budget components in January of this year. And since then, we've been working in very close coordination with our providers to amend contracts and implement the enhancements. And we're currently in the final stages of contract amendment. Although it is still too early in the process to discuss outcomes, we're heartened by the positive feedback we've received from our providers so far, and we look forward to the results to come. I must give enormous acknowledgement to the two colleagues who are here with me at the table today, who oversaw the process and established an extraordinary level of partnership with our providers while simultaneously remaining relentless in keeping the process moving forward. I'm also proud of the unprecedented levels of collaboration with our providers, with Kafka, and across the divisions within ACS. I'd also like to thank our nonprofit and city agency partners for making this possible. This model budget process is proof that by working together and listening, we can achieve great results. So I thank you for the opportunity to discuss ACS's model budget process. We appreciate the Council's advocacy on behalf of our prevention service pro provider community and for the role the Council has played in making our model budget a reality. ACS endeavors to maintain our transparent relationship with the City Council, and we will continue to seek your guidance and support as we move ahead with our implementation efforts. Thank you for your time, and we are happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, providers uh, that we've heard from uh, that contract with ACS have given us feedback that um, they're happy with the model budgeting process thus far. Can you share what you think has made that the case, made that successful? Uh, I can, and I also ask uh, Dr. Martin and, and uh, Ms. Berger to do that as well. I, th I, think, um, I think there are a couple of things from my perspective, uh, the most important of which, as I mentioned in my testimony, uh, was the degree of collaboration. We listened. Um, we did not uh, immediately start down a path uh, uh, based on what we thought uh, was uh, what would make the biggest difference in terms of increasing service utilization, which was our core objective here. Um, we started with a listening tour. And once we completed a listening tour, which enabled us to sort of get very broad horizontal input, um, we then uh, put together a working group, as I mentioned, um, which was more focused, uh, smaller number of people, but people at different levels in the organization with whom we could have really comprehensive discussion about um, the fundamental things that were uh, inhibiting them from delivering services, from serving as many families as we wanted them to, and from delivering the quality of service that we, that we wanted them to deliver. And it was only after we completed that listening process and that collaboration 
that we then develop the very prescript prescriptive sense of uh, where the investments could be made in the model budget based on what we'd heard, where we thought it would have the most impact on increasing service utilization. Um, let me ask Dr. Martin if she'd like to elaborate at all on that. Um, sure. I think everything that the commissioner said is correct. Uh, we also had a goal to uh, get the money over to the provider agencies as quickly and as expeditiously as possible. And so our charge was to really develop a very lean process to making this happen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, Kaylee Berger was very instrumental in that. So, yeah. Um, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but ACS is you've um, applied model budgeting to the preventive service contracts. Is there a plan to apply it to everything in the future? Uh, we don't have a current plan to go beyond this. We obviously haven't been funded uh, to do it in any other sector. Uh, I would say that because we think it's been so successful as a model, um, we're, we'd be interested. And so it's certainly something that we'll take a look at going forward. Uh, but we don't have any current plans or any current funding to go into other sectors of our service delivery. And how, how, is, how are you guys tracking the budget modeling process to determine uh, progress or, you know, in areas for improvement? Well, uh, as I said, it's, it's um, a little bit too early to really track outcomes since we're just finishing the, the contract amendments to actually pass the funding on to the providers. But um, the ultimate thing we're going to track, because it is the goal of this whole process, is service utilization. And that is something we track very, very closely. Um, we maintain um, very close um, oversight of utilization uh, in every preventive service category by every individual provider and every individual program. And so ultimately what we'll be tracking most significantly in terms of the effectiveness of the model budget is whether it enables us to maintain and improve our service utilization so that we're in a position to provide timely services to families and children when they need them. I know the steering committee found that wait lists for referrals into prevention services has been a challenge. Do, do you guys ha have ideas for addressing that or plan to address that? Well, in truth, it was that challenge that was really what spurred this. Uh, when I became commissioner in March of last year, um, uh, as I was, you know, doing my due diligence of the agency, learning the agency, one of the things that I learned very quickly and that concerned me a great deal was that at that time we did have a significant wait list uh, for preventive services. We had hundreds of families who were waiting longer than we consider appropriate. We had identified a need. Uh, we had identified a, uh, the kind of service the family needed, but we could not immediately provide that kind of service to the family. And it was that realization, again, that was about 15 months ago when I started, um, that led us to begin a conversation internally first and then through the budget process with the council about what we needed to do to address that wait list, which I think we all felt was unacceptable. Um, I'm happy to say that we worked very hard last year to uh, eliminate that wait list, uh, which we did successfully. Um, and our hope is that through the model budget process, once we get the, all these enhancements in place with the providers, that uh, using these new resources, they will be able to ramp up their capacity, ramp up their utilization, so we can maintain uh, a place where we'll be able to provide timely services to families. Um, have you shared w what you've learned in this process with other city agencies, proactively, or if they ask, or you should? Yeah. Uh, we are certainly happy to that's, do that. That's <laughs> the free tip. From um, we we, <laughs> we charge for that one. We talk regularly with our, our agency partners, uh, and certainly this has come up in those conversations, and we're obviously happy to share any information with them. Um, okay, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chair Levin. Thank you, Chair Brannon. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I want to ask uh, a question just on one of the uh, issues that you raised in your testimony mm -hmm. regarding uh, the children that were separated at the border that are now. Um, you know, here in foster care agency custody in, in New York City. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find out where this was reported, but um, the, the governor, I think, mentioned that uh, the, the federal government is, is preventing the state from providing additional resources that may be 
needed uh, mental health resources, medical resources, um, uh, to uh, uh, to these children. I, I, it, it, have you heard the same thing? Is ACS being prevented from providing? Uh, you know, they're they're in a federal. They're in a, they're, 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 these children are in the custody of a foster care agency that has uh, a federal contract, um, or multiple agencies that have federal contracts that may or may not have uh, city contracts. But is there anything that New York City can do um, um, to assist these children? Um, or are we being told by the federal government uh, that we're prevented from doing so? Mm -hmm. Well, let me say a little bit about the, the structure of the program under which they are, are, are being um, cared for. Uh, they are, the children who <coughs> have been separated at the border and brought to New York are under the jurisdiction of the Federal Office of Refugee Resettlement and the Refugee Resettlement Program. Um, they are cared for by providers under contract to that program, not to ACS or any New York City agency. And the jurisdiction and oversight of that program is federal, not city. So we don't have any uh, you know, regulatory authority or licensing or contractual authority over those programs. Um, the facility that I visited yesterday with the mayor, Cayuga Centers, uh, we understand is one of three in New York City where some of these children are uh, being cared for. We understand there are two others. Um, and it happens that that program, Cayuga Centers, is one that is also a foster care provider for New York City. Mm -hmm. That is you know, somewhat coincidental that they happen to have these two different contracts with two different um, uh, government jurisdictions. Um, when we met with them yesterday, we met with the staff uh, of, the, of that facility, that program, um, and we offered to provide any assistance to them that they might need to make sure that they were able to uh, meet all the, the service needs, particularly health care, mental health, and associated needs the kids might have. Um, they welcomed that commitment. They didn't identify specific uh, areas of need. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not aware of any prohibition on doing that, so I, I don't know what, uh, what barrier the state has encountered. Um, we have not, um, you know, this, this was in a conversation with the provider themselves, not directly with the federal government. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can only say that the provider, this particular provider, was receptive to the city's offer of support. Okay, that's helpful to know. Um, I expect that we're gonna be um, uh, conducting um, additional hearings uh, on this topic in the coming weeks. So um, you know, as, as things arise, uh, we'll, we'll We'll be in correspondence. Absolutely. This is obviously an issue of enormous concern to all of us, and I think the more uh, public attention and more light we shed on it, the better. So I Great. appreciate that the council did that. Um, uh, on to the model budget question. I may, I'm, I'm, I'm searching for where that's reported. Um, uh, on to the model budget questions. Um, this is only applying to preventive service contracts. Are you exploring other ACS contracts? Um, foster care contracts, for example, um, where, where model budgeting may apply? We're, uh, Chair Brennan asked a similar question. We okay. are uh, not currently uh, exploring a model budget process per se, um, and of course we're not funded uh, to do that. However, um, we are going through a process of looking very closely at our foster care contracts because um, they uh, also have been in place for many years. Um, and are slated to expire in uh, a couple years from now. So we are beginning the process of thinking about what we think the next iteration of those foster care contracts will be, and as part of that, certainly thinking about the funding model for them. So in a sense, we're looking at many of the same issues uh, mm -hmm. in the foster care area, but not through a model budget process per se. Um, I, I, and the issues that uh, came up with um, homeless services contracts, particularly uh, around fringe rates and indirect costs, are those issues that had that came up through your process as well? And and uh, is there any ability to address that through the model budget process? Um, or they, the side? yeah, they really didn't come up in the process itself. We uh, we did, uh, as as I discussed, we did uh, well separate from the uh, the model budget. We of course added colas right. to the pro and then we did add wage increases through the model budget process. Right. The fringe issue, I think, is really. Uh, an issue across the entire human services sector. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that we're talking with our sister city agencies about, uh, mm -hmm. but it wasn't really uh, a focus of discussion in the preventive model budget process. But wage was, so in 
contrast with the DHS process where they said that kind of wage parity or parity across, does it, it's different, right? It, D, DHS uh, uh, contracts have been on a kind of rolling basis probably for 30, 25, 30 years. And so that's why there's, there, uh, there, there's such disparate, um, uh, you know, contract uh, uh, specifics. But um, uh, in terms of, of at least setting up um, the ability to, to in, um, for a not-for-profit to be able to increase wages, they don't seem to have included that as part of their model budget process. But, but ACS saw that as within your jurisdiction to do that, or within your kind of mandate uh, to, to to look at wage wages across the board. Yes, uh, clearly, and it was one of the four categories uh, in which we uh, actually required providers to invest resources. They could do it in several different ways, but right. we that was one of the areas that they were uh, required to invest some of the resources. Um, how did ACS determine the amount of funding that was required to meet all of these needs, or, or how is it, where did the magic number come from in terms of how much uh, the model budget process was going to be able to deliver to not-for-profits? Uh, to be honest, I have to say it came from you. It was the, oh. it was the money we were allocated in the city budget. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it was, it, was, it, was, it was tailored to fit the, the, it was tailored to fit the funding that was allocated, not, not the other way around. That's correct. Um, are there any other things that you would have done uh, included in the model budget process if, if there were more funds available? <laughs> well, uh, it's always hard to say you wouldn't find uses for more money. Hypothetically, I suppose we would. But, but no, I think we certainly feel that the amount of money we were allocated and what we've been able to do with it will be sufficient to address the utilization concerns that we've experienced. So uh, you know, we're qu quite comfortable that this level of investment is going to make a significant difference and move us in the direction we need to go. Mm -hmm. um, and so you may have spoken about this with, um, with Chair Brandon. The, the, um, the issue of the first phase versus the second phase and what, how uh, you addressed issues that came up in the first phase around communication and um, uh, what, what did you learn there and how did you address it in the subsequent phase? And if you could identify yourself for the record, sure. please. Hi, I'm Kaylee Berger. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Community-Based Strategies and Prevention. Um, and I sort of marshaled this mm -hmm. process. Um, so for phase one, um, there was some urgency in getting those funds out, and they had been allocated prior to the phase two funding. So we mm -hmm. wanted to do that quickly. And our finance team um, did it sort of business as usual, where we sent out a memo, we let folks know, and then we asked them to fill out their budgets and return them back. What we realized was that providers have a lot on their plate and take some time to update a budget and there were lots of questions and so we really in phase two wanted to try to streamline that and take more of a customer service approach. And so instead of sort of sharing, pushing it out and having them send information back to us, we tried to do as much as we could behind the scenes um, to make that process go more quickly. Um, in the first phase as well, we had sort of decided within ACS what the three categories would be for funding and that was for our conference facilitators, for training, and for the COLA wages adjustment. Um, so those had already been decided sort of internally based on demands and needs that we needed to align with the practices. Mm -hmm. um, and so for phase two, we had more flexibility to say to providers, what are the needs that are most pressing for you and how can we address those quickly? Okay. Again, how many, how many providers are, are, are within your, the preventive system? Uh, 54 providers okay. uh, and with a total of 111 contracts, I believe. Okay. Yeah. So in terms of the at least number of contracts and providers is actually somewhat analogous to to the DHS numbers and just in terms of contracts and, and providers obviously more complicated system over there um, uh, can you explain a little bit about the steering committee how it was formed who was invited to join or how did it was it self-selecting or did the providers all get together and nominate somebody or <laughs> So I wish we had time to do a full nomination process, but we were really uh -huh. quickly trying to engage with the providers. So, so what we did was really um, put provider engagement at the forefront of our priorities. So uh, as the commissioner said, we did do a listening tour over the course of three months, and we attended a, a number of meetings with provider staff at all levels. Um, we then also held focus groups because we wanted to dig deeper and make sure we um, engaged with the front line. So we actually had over 90 provider staff at all levels come to those focus groups. Um, and then we convened the provider steering committee in partnership with Kafka. 
with the goal of having a representative sample of provider leadership. So we look to mm -hmm. various size, neighborhoods represented, types of services represented, and we identified some providers that met those criteria. And then part of the um, role of being a steering committee member was the expectation that they would engage with their colleagues across the rest of the provider community. So we worked with them as well as with Kafka to ensure every piece of information that was discussed in the steering committee was also disseminated and there was engagement with the other providers who were not part of the steering committee. Um, and then at the end of the process, we put together a guide that we shared with staff at all levels and the steering committee and all the leadership of the provider agencies. So they had all the materials that we used in those meetings as well. We wanted to ensure transparency and that if folks had questions, you know, they could contact us and be a part of it. So we were, we were available to talk to any provider who had any questions. Sorry, you mentioned Kafka. Can you explain what Kafka is? Sure. The Council of Family and Child Caring Agencies, they are an advocacy organization that represents um, the majority of our provider agencies, and they do a lot of training and are a good convener, um, so we mm -hmm. worked with them as partners to help with convening and, and disseminating information. And they played a meaningful role in this process? They sure did. Um, uh, did the steering committee talked about, and this process talked about, um, uh, wait lists for referrals um, to, prevent a, uh, to prevent a services. Um, so how, how, how do we think, uh, how are we looking to you know, long term address the issue of wait lists? I know Chair Brandon asked about this, but. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, as I had s said, th th that was one of the driving uh, factors in, in the process. The, the, uh, as we sort of took apart the the waitlist issue. There are a number of causal factors, but one of the most significant was uh, the inability of providers to recruit and retain uh, the staff they needed to run the programs. And so uh, many of our providers were unable to deliver the contracted capacity of services that we expected because they could not maintain the level of staffing they needed to do that. Because of wage issues. Because of wage issues primarily. Also supervision, which we uh, have tried to address here. Um, and so, uh, so those that was a direct, uh, you know, a, a direct uh, influence on how we structured the the model budget process and the components of investment that providers could make. Um, there are obviously other issues that feed into um, uh, waitlist as well. Uh, issues about our, our you know protocols for opening cases, closing cases, and things like that, which were also addressed in the process of reducing the waitlist last year mm -hmm. and that we continue to remain very vigilant about as we go forward. Um, with the Kauai Assurance staff, um, what type of training is ACS providing to, the, to, that, to those, um, those newly hired um, uh, quality control staff? So I can uh, begin the question, to answer the question and then I'll turn it over to Kaylee. Uh, so through the Workforce Institute, ACS uh, offers a number of trainings to our provider agencies, mm -hmm. and it is our intent to really work closely with the quality improvement staff. Uh, we are really looking forward to, uh, you know, integrating them in our work um, around the, um, the data metrics that we manage um, and share with provider agencies. So for example, ensuring that there's someone at the agency to uh, routinely look at their utilization data and other metrics that we measure uh, at ACS to ensure that they're providing quality services. So they'll be integrated into that. We're also looking forward to uh, you know, working with the agencies and training them around the use of the Safe Measures uh, dashboard when that comes um, online for the provider agencies. So I would just add that um, as part of the robust technical assistance we've been providing to our providers, um, we worked with them collaboratively to develop a job description for that QAQI person mm -hmm. um, because this is one of the bucket areas for funding where we gave one um, an allocation for every single provider agency to hire a QAQI staff person. That's across the board. Exactly. Okay. So um, some of our provider agencies already have robust QAQI departments, but for our smaller, more neighborhood-based providers, they may not have a QAQI person or they may use consultants or some other mm -hmm. approach. So for those folks, they had never interviewed or hired someone with those kinds of qualifications. So we what are the I'm sorry, what are the qualifications? For so that? we want someone who can bridge the gap between practice and also using data. So our goal was to find someone who is comfortable with Excel, who knows how to deal with a database system, who can create data reports and understand them, but also who 
who understands the world of child welfare and how to use those metrics to help improve practice. So our goal was to help those smaller agencies hire the right person. Mm -hmm. and, and this is sort of a new opportunity for us to have a, an army of 54 quality insurance people uh -huh. that we can collaborate with to really drive change and improvements in, in child welfare. So we're looking forward to developing um, more collaboration with that group. Okay. Um, and going back to the kind of menu of items that um, the model budget provided for, um, do you have a sense of kind of percentage-wise who, who selected you know, kind of how, how it broke down and, and um, where the, where the uh, kind of, where uh, uh, <laughs> providers wanted to go? Sure. So within the four um, menu items, actually the providers were required to adopt all of them. Okay. So everybody's getting the quality assurance person, everybody will hire case aids, um, and everyone will reduce that supervisory ratio. Where there was some flexibility, and we did this because we have providers that have very different sort of, some have union restrictions, others have different staffing levels. We wanted to make sure they had flexibility around the salary supports area. Mm -hmm. And so they had three options um, between which they could allocate those funding. Um, we have specific percentages I could get to you, but the vast majority of the funding um, is going toward salary increases, and then smaller amounts going to the sort of differential program and then the career ladders um, longevity program. Um, and then my final question is, um, is ACS viewing this process as a kind of an ongoing con uh, process that will continue on to the future, or are you seeing this as a kind of a one-time thing? Um, because obviously there's, I think, a great benefit to using the structure that's been set up to, um, to carry on to other program areas and other providers and, um, and uh, you know, meeting additional needs as they come up. But, you know, that a, a, a process that by all accounts that I've heard is, has been um, successful you know, it, it would be uh, beneficial, I believe, to the to the sector as a whole to, to keep that structure moving forward. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Councilmember, I think what I would say is, while the model budget process per se was enabled by the funding allocation to do it, mm -hmm. um, so you know, as a model budget process, that's something we can sort of only do under uh, under those circumstances. However. Um, we're constantly looking at ways to improve our contract structures. And of course, all of our programs, all of our contracted programs are time limited um, and have to be reviewed and re-procured uh, on a periodic basis. And in fact, as I mentioned, um, all of our foster care contracts, and in fact, all of our preventive contracts as well, um, will end uh, in the next few years. And so we will be doing um, some very large procurements uh, for the future of both the foster care program and the preventive program. So uh, what I would say is we're certainly uh, going to use what we would consider some of the best practices that emerge from this process as we look to the future of those programs. Certainly the collaboration with providers, the ways in which we got input from providers, uh, the combination of you know, flexibility and prescriptiveness, uh, the individual hands-on uh, technical assistance once we got to the budget process, I mean, all of those things, I think, are practices that are certainly generalizable uh, to uh, not just the future of our programs, but probably other kinds of human services programs as well. Okay, that's it for me. I'll turn it back over to my co-chair. Thank you, Chair. I just want to um, point something out. I know the Human Services uh, Advancement Strategy Group advocated for $200 million in the FY19 budget which we supported. City Council ultimately, uh, it wasn't adopted in the final budget, but we were there for you. So just reminding you how fantastic <laughs> we are. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> we appreciate that. Um, I think we're good. Yeah. Thank you guys very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, we have our first panel for advocates. Stand by. So we're going to hear from the first panel will be Allison Sesso and Michelle Jackson from the Human Services Council. 
Gina Paik from the Nonprofit Finance Fund, and Beatrice Diaz Tavares from Catholic Charities. And we're gonna we're gonna put you guys on a two minute clock because I have graduations tomorrow morning. It's almost time okay. to order breakfast. Fair enough. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. So I'm Allison Sesso. I'm the executive director of the Human Services Council. And um, I just want to start by thanking you for taking the time to have this hearing, for advocating in the budget process. We have brought these issues to everyone's attention sort of relentlessly. I get tired of hearing myself talk about the insolvency issues that the nonprofit sector is facing. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be talking about these issues. And I wanted to just take a minute and explain. You mentioned the Human Services Advancement Strategy Group, which is a mouthful. Um, that group is consisting of nine umbrella associations that came together because we recognized the critical nature of the, the the nonprofit sector and the fiscal challenges that it faces, and that we all together need to advocate for change, that, that we can't continue to get paid not enough money to cover this, the work and get paid um, late and very, very late in, in, in a lot of instances. And I think it was raised here today, uh, the reality that these issues have been around for a long time. Um, it is not the, you know, this administration's fault. It is, this is a problem that actually exists across the country, and I want to acknowledge that. But I also think New York City can do better and that we are leaders and that we need to do better because we also have a responsibility ultimately to the communities that we serve. And that is what this is about. Ultimately, this is about our ability to serve communities well. The infrastructure of the nonprofits matter. And it's not that sexy. I get it. Indirect rates, who cares? You know, but it, it does matter to how we deliver services. And that's what we need to fix in order to make sure that we are doing right by communities. And I always want to bring it back to that. Um, I just want to. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking. I want to make sure that you hear from the providers who really live this. I'm an advocate. I talk, you know, at a high level. Um, but I do want to say that the fiscal distress is real. It's concrete. Um, the margins that the nonprofits have to operate in are very, very thin. We've seen a lot of them go under. I think the capacity to meet the needs of communities is going to be undermined if we don't fix this. We appreciate what you've been doing. Um, and we did ask for specific investments uh, this year, and we do appreciate the investments that were made in previous years, but the problem is the lag in getting that money out the door and to the providers. So that's what I want to say. And the, the last thing I want to say is I want to acknowledge that the administration has actually agreed to meet with us and talk about these issues. So there is a recognition on their part to work with us on this, and I, I'm hoping that that will lead to some real resolution. And I do want to acknowledge the work of MOX and others um, in, in trying to work through some of these things. So thank you for your Great. leadership and thank support. You. Thank you. So I'm Michelle Jackson. I'm the deputy director for HSC, and I really want to focus on we – are advocates and we're asking for more funding and more systems changes. And we want to do that in a way that also authentically acknowledges what the administration and the council have done for us, both in funding, both pro a lot of program funding, the important investment in last year. So my analogy is you have a beat beaten down old car and you decide to fix it. And everything needs to be fixed. So you put new tires on the car, but there's no engine. You needed those new tires, but without the engine, the car doesn't run. And that's a lot, the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee has made really crucial process changes, like the advance that, that Jennifer Geiling um, talked about, um, this work on indirect rate, which we're waiting to see you know, how that will be implemented. But there's been a lot of really great advances. Uh, those are tires. But the engine, <laughs> the procurement process itself, is still broken. And so if you put gas into the car, like the 300 million last year, but there's no gas line to get it to the engine, it's now June 20th, 21st, and that's a year since those investments were made, and providers don't have that money. Um, so going forward, we're obviously looking at how to fix this lags in registration issue. It's worse than it's been in previous years, even with accelerator and other efficiencies that have been made. That needs to get fixed. We're asking for a SWAT team to go in and look at that. Uh, we're asking for an increase on fringe rates, um, as has been talked about, and we appreciate that. A bigger increase on indirect, 10% is a great start, but that's just not the realistic indirect rates of these nonprofits, and it really leads to their insolvency. That should be Those should be investments that are made in this year, and we appreciate the conversations about salary parity um, and the AC model budget we just want to point out should really be the model that's used going forward if every model budget had been like that one we'd be advocating for model budgets across all pro program areas 
Um, so we need to fix the engine <laughs> and put on tires and fix the gas line. It's a big lift and all of those parts are really important, but they all need to be done um, together and they all need to be done immediately. So the idea that we're kicking the can down the road on some of these things means the car never works, right? So thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to add to that. We can't get a new car. We got to fix the old right. car. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, if we could start over, that'd be great, but. Okay. <laughs> fix the car, fix this car. <laughs> Hi, my name is Gina Paik. I represent Nonprofit Finance Fund. We're a community development financial institution, so we're a lender, we're a financial consultant um, to the nonprofit sector here in the city, but also across the country. And I'm here to report on the state of the sector survey that we recently published, but across the country, but also speaking to how that compares to New York City's statistics. So um, one factor that I wanted to kind of raise also is that, you know, uh, we showed that 90% of uh, New York City respondents who serve human services say that their contracts are underfunded. And so that's, and 69% of the time that happens very, very often. So we wanted to just show how widespread this issue is, particularly with city contracts. Um, and 75% of them report that their contracts are not only late, but very, very late. So a third of them reported that there were delays of over three months, and that's actually three times the comparable national rate that we saw in our survey. Um, so, and, and of course, subsequently, we saw that their uh, cash flow challenges were uh, reported as higher, as a bigger concern than across the country. Um, so almost a quarter of the New York City human service organizations that we uh, surveyed s had a, a one month or less of cash on hand. And if you ask any for-profit business, that means that they're on the brink of insolvency. Um, but this is how a lot of nonprofits function, but it's very problematic and it causes um, fragility and, and, and um, really threatens the, the communities that they serve. So a lot of organizations also we know from the survey turn to debt to not just you know uh, their own cash reserves, returning to debt to um, to manage these cash flow challenges, and that debt comes at a cost that is not reimbursed through contracts, um, and um, and you know another tactic is delaying their bills or sometimes not paying their staff. So again, these are not things that we want to see, but we do see. Uh, and the last thing I want to talk about is uh, within the survey, we show that 43% of nonprofits uh, in New York City reported less than 10% indirect rate on their local contracts. And we know from just working with organizations, that's far lower than uh, true overhead, which can range, we think, anywhere from 15 to maybe 35%. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Brandon and Chairman Levin. Um, I am Beatrice Diaz Severus, Executive Director of Catholic Charities Community Services, and I'm pleased to speak about the work of the Federation of Catholic Charities Agencies, not only as a contracting agency, a provider of social services, but also the current challenges we face. I'm going to echo what many of my colleagues are, have said and will say this afternoon. But just to give you a broad overstroke, the Catholic Charities Federation of Agencies is 90. Some very large, over 100 million, to some very small, under a million dollar. In conjunction, in, in total, we administer about 1,000 city human service contracts with all major New York City agencies. And these contracts are valued at just under $200 million. And the services we provide touch almost 150 New Yorkers in need, 150,000 New Yorkers in need, not 150. Um, I'm going to address HSS Accelerator. In its first phase, it was great. It helped reduce paperwork, pairing cons consequent delays in um, procurement processes, so we are very happy. But not all city agencies use it, and I think that is a major concern, especially with the Department of Education. So we would like all city agencies to be part of the HSS Accelerator, and we're really strongly advocating for that. Also. Um, discretionary contracts. We are very happy that the City Council does award us discretionary contracts, but I would like to tell you their processing is also extremely delayed. I can tell you I still have six contracts from fiscal year 18 that are not registered and understand that we're closing fiscal year 18 in nine days. So somehow that processing of discretionary contracts has to be looked at and how that can be absorbed into the accelerator system and make it go much smoother and faster. If we know that the city budget was passed in early June, 
I don't know why June of a year later I'm still not received. Um, lags. My agency, we're still waiting on $2.8 million from 24 contracts. This is, um, I have 100, I have to uh, provide those services. So as of July of last year, I'm spending money. Small agencies, as my colleague says, have to take loans, which are then the interest is not reimbursable. COLA implementation. I can tell you, this morning, I just signed off on contracts to DYCD for fiscal year 17 COLA implementation. That's how long it's taken. So we're not talking even about a year, but two years ago. So uh, continuing on, Again, we are part of the Human Services Investment Strategy Group and we continue to advocate. But the, the, uh, the areas that we really do need is again, investment in our indirect costs. It should be at 15%. We need 10% increase in our occupancy, casualty and liability insurance. And we spoke about the fringe rate. It really should be brought up to 37% on all human service council contracts. Thank you again for providing me this opportunity to testify. I have a full testimony before you. I just gave you brief snippets. Highlight. Um, uh, the, the discretionary uh, awards is concerning to me. Are you working with the individual members to figure that out? Um, we, no, we have not. On certain areas, we have, but on others, we don't, because it goes through its own different contracting process. It's not really, so you have different people assigned to it, and although it, it is assigned to different agencies, some agencies are able to get their acts together faster than others. I can tell you, DIFTA is one that they work on it right away, but other agencies, not so okay. much. Um, I, I'm just gonna share my, you know, office's information with you before you leave, just sure. so we can try to wiggle something loose to see what's what. So we will welcome that definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Chair Levin. Yeah. Thank you, Chair Brandon. Um, uh, so, what do you do about the discrepancy between the fringe rates that's set in the contract and the fringe rate that you pay uh, out uh, for your employees? I mean, I think we all know that nonprofits have become party planners. Yes. <laughs> I was just about to say, we aggressively fundraise from our private donors. But oh. that's... So that's what you... So when you're calling... So, so th th this is a call to a private donor. Hi, this is Catholic Charities. Uh, we need to raise money for our fringe rate. And, and, and donors are like, yeah, sounds <laughs> great. That's, no. well, I, I don't that, think you talk do about many, that. We yeah. do many different things. Right. <laughs> But you know we do fundraise for general operating costs. That's you know that's something we do tell our 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 contracts, city contracts. Generally, most of our contracts, not only city but state, only cover eighty five to ninety percent of the true operating cost. Mm -hmm. So that is a message that we do give our donors, and we are upfront that we need general operating. We need to. Um, have our finance people paid. We do need to have our insurance paid. We do need to pay our occupancy costs. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of doing business. And do you yeah. get a, s oh. And what we see is that it's actually now the fringe rates are compressing because of that, right? So nonprofits are, um, you know, they can fundraise and the ones that are really good who have endowments or are great fundraisers like Catholic Charities um, can sometimes make ends meet, but we've absolutely seen a trend from our members that they are cutting insurance or passing those costs on to staff. So health insurance, they're picking the cheaper plan. These are all workers who are frontline staff who are underpaid already. Um, right. mm -hmm. And now we're seeing that those, you know, those costs are being passed on and they're cutting back on 403B benefits, health insurance, family plans, that kind of thing, because they have a 26% fringe rate and they you know, have to deal with that. Uh, and so family coverage is not offered mm -hmm. in many agencies. They will only cover the individual. Should the employee want to cover their family, they have to pick up that dime. And I could tell mm -hmm. you, a family coverage for three or more people costs $26,000. So an employee, an individual is around six or $7,000, an employee is asked to pay $14,000 into his family plan. So that employee is making how much a year, like on average? <laughs> like 29,000. About 29,000, yes. 29,000. They're not so going to take the family coverage. So that's like more than half yeah. of their income. They'd yes. have to pay to pay for health insurance for the rest of their family. 
And I, I want to actually cite um, a Fiscal Policy Institute report from 2017 that said that 60% yeah. of human service employees were either using or had family using some form of public assistance. Mm -hmm. So I think that shows some mm -hmm. of the, yeah. Right, yes. and certainly. Um, like Medicaid, food stamps. Right. I mean, I, I, I talked to a not-for-profit provider uh, the other day that said that one of the reasons why their fringe rate might not be 37% but might be a little bit lower is because so many of their employees are, are on uh, either, a, you know, Child Health Plus or, mm -hmm. or, or Medicaid. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, have you brought this to the attention of the Nonprofit Resiliency no. Committee? Um, we have. Um, I was th there is, uh, you know, I think that there's only so many issues that can be taken on per year, and I would, you know, commend actually Jennifer Geiling, who's responsible for coordinating the group, um, in in taking those issues on and being very transparent about what issues are are being dealt with in what years. And we are actually at a point in that committee's process in thinking about what issues to take on uh, going forward. And I think it has been articulated that fringe is one of those issues that we'd like to see worked on uh, through the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee. I don't know that it's been agreed to that that's officially going to happen, but mm -hmm. it has certainly been articulated. Um, what would be your recommendation for um, either DHS or ACS as they move forward? with their implementation? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's across agencies, right? I mean, I, I think the first thing is SWAT. Whether the SWAT team needs to come in and clean up the registration. You, there needs to be a real focus on getting this backlog. Of Where does that SWAT team live? They, it, they need to make it up, right? So Where should <laughs> it live? <laughs> I mean, I think it should live at MOX um, as the contracting agency. I, it does need to be centralized. The different city agencies need to be acting in similar capacities. We have providers who have multiple contracts across city agencies. There should be a streamlined process that makes sense across agencies. So mm -hmm. MOX is a natu natural entity to own that. Mm -hmm. But someone really needs to go in. The state does something similar. Might, maybe a, a standard operating procedure? Absolutely. Oh, yes. And I think this is an, something that needs immediate attention, right? Like So the mm -hmm. state just did this. They called their lean team that went in and cleaned up some contracts. And so it's, yes, the long-term processes need to happen, but we have all of the, you know, hundreds of amendments from the COLA and Indirect and the model budget that are waiting, plus millions of dollars of contracts that providers have been putting out, you know, all year. They need to get cleaned up and they need to get cleaned up quickly. So that's the first thing. And then I think going forward, you know, we need to fix the funding mechanisms uh, through the RFP process. There's a collaborative program design through the NRC. We're seeing, for example, the Sonic RFP just came out and the rates on it have the pre-COLA and indirect dollars. So Nonprofits are signing their COLA agreements that right now, right, and waiting for those amendments, and then they're going to compete on the Sonic RFP that has rates that are old. Wow, what? Why is? Do we know why that is? <laughs> so, just it was written earlier or something like that. Yeah, I mean, or later. I, you know, that's the thing. I think it's just this. The RFP process needs to be collaborative. It needs to involve providers. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a real commitment to elevating. You know, if you can't put money in for fringe right now you should be moving things for, you know, in RFPs, there should be the standards that we want to see should be moving forward so that mm -hmm. where there's corrective action in the long term and then something like SWAT team and standard operating procedures should be implemented now to clean up the backlog that we're seeing. So it needs to be, we need money now, we need systems now, and then we need long-term solutions. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other recommendations anyone else want to? I mean, I would just echo the idea that that I think that the, the mayor's office of contract service should be empowered to to really own this process and oversight in a way that I don't think they have been given that that to date. They really do understand the issues. They are uh, great collaborator collaborators, but they don't necessarily have control over this each each agency, as you saw today. There's a vast difference between them, and so I think there should be more authority be be given there. All right. Well, thank you very thank much you. for your testimony and for your ongoing partnership with with all of your agencies that you work with and us at the council. Thank you. Okay, we have our next panel. Uh, Louisa Chafee from UJA, Emily Miles from FPWA, and Kevin Douglas from United Neighborhood Houses.
How you guys doing? Good. Who wants to start? Sure, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> So good afternoon, Chair Brennan and Chair Levin. Uh, my name is Kevin Douglas. I am the co-director of policy and advocacy with United Neighborhood Houses. We are an association of nonprofit settlement houses and community centers here in New York City. We have 39 members who serve about three quarters of a million New Yorkers every year. And they have all uh, doing multi-service, multi-generational work. And many of them gone through the model budget process with a variety of agencies before you today. I want to focus my comments on one of the agencies that, that wasn't here to, to talk today, which was uh, DIFTA, Department for the Aging, uh, which had the procurement uh, reform around the senior center process. Uh, because we're limited on time, I'm going to give you highlights and lowlights, if you will. Cool. Uh, the highlights are we're really grateful to the administration for making a pretty historic commitment to actually funding increases in the older adult service system, which hadn't been done in a really long time. It was a meaningful and real investment. Uh, the lowlights uh, were that the process really could have been handled a lot better. Uh, there was a significant lack of transparency in terms of how the agency dealt with providers and the associations that represent them. I think we heard a shining example from ACS about what collaboration with providers look like, and that was not the case at all uh, with the Department for the Aging. It was March of this year when DIFTA formally communicated to providers how much money they were going to get and how they could actually claim to use it. Uh, which was sort of three quarters of the fiscal year. There was no focus groups. There were no collaborative outreach of 90 staff. I, I was just sort of astounded hearing sort of with ACS how uh, much they engaged the community. So that was the first problem is there wasn't any transparency. They've talked about formulas they've used to come up with the numbers that went to each provider. They've never provided public information about what those formulas were or how much each provider got. A lot of them are scratching their heads why they got X amount versus Y amount. Uh, another big problem that actually I think drove that a little bit was the fact there was only $10 million invested. So again, it was great that we got the funding, but it was far below what was needed. Uh, there's 249 contracted senior centers through DIFTA. $10 million doesn't go very far. And so from the beginning, there was going to be things that were left off the table. And it was uh, a process that wasn't really collaborative to address the fact there wasn't a lot of money. How do we best use it? Uh, very quickly to, to wrap up, uh, two other challenges. One is there wasn't enough flexibility provided. Because there wasn't enough money to go around, uh, DIFTA excluded major expenses within senior centers and said, well, those aren't going to be part of the model budget process. We'll figure those out maybe in the future. Uh, so that was the major cost that was excluded. Uh, food costs and the staff who provide the food were specifically excluded from the process. After some protest, I, I guess from uh, folks up here and around the room, OMB agreed to loosen up the regulations around that. But at that point, over half of the Providers had already submitted their budgets and weren't going to go through the process again to try to bring in their kitchen staff. Uh, the last thing I would say is really echoing the last panel. Uh, this doesn't all rest with DIFTA. The fact that is the system as a whole is so dramatically underfunded with late contracts, inadequate, fringe, and indirect. It was kind of hard to lay a model budget on top of that when the foundation itself was really flawed. So moving forward, we'd love to see the additional $10 million that DIFTA has promised for this process actually come out as soon as possible and to do it in a collaborative way with providers to make sure it works well. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jeanette Esteem, and I'm a senior policy analyst with FPWA. Uh, thank you, Chairpersons Brandon and Levin, for the opportunity to testify here today. Um, I want to echo everything that Kevin has said uh, around the DIFTA model budget process for senior centers. Um, we were very grateful to see this commitment from the administration, um, but we were also concerned by the significant delays in the process and a model budget that ultimately le leaves a lot of costs unfunded. Um, we are pleased that the administration has heard some of these concerns and is planning to meet with advocates to discuss the issues that, that Kevin discussed and that I'm going to just say a little bit about. Um, we do think the process could have been improved in two important ways, by increasing the transparency and uh, being finalized in time to be implemented in FY18, which is the year in which the initial funding was allocated. Um, as DIFTA and OMB created a methodology and considered the goals of the model budget, providers were not consulted to give feedback or invited to give feedback, um, and it's in sharp contrast with the process we saw at ACS. Um, and as for the timing, of course, many centers have not uh, had their contracts amended and registered yet. Moreover, the uh, model budget is said to be fully implemented by FY21, which prolongs the amount of time that the centers must function 
uh, without the funding that DIFTA has determined is required for baseline operations. And it also puts them at a disadvantage when it comes time to complete for the next RFP, um, which will be coming out in 2020. So we urge the administration to implement this funding immediately. Regarding the model budget itself, the $20 million uh, that was allocated simply doesn't cover the full cost of baseline operations. Uh, there were three major categories of expenditures that were not considered for correction through this process around food, occupancy, and OTPS. The senior centers uh, play such an important role in reducing food insecurity, which is why there are fundamental service um, that, that's provided. Uh, so a model budget that excludes meals and the related staffing to provide those meals is simply incomplete. Um, we understand that occupancy and OTPS costs can vary widely, they're, but they're clearly critical to operating these centers and should be accounted for in some way. So we urge that DIFTA, OMB, and the administration reconsider the uh, model budget to include all core expenses um, and the centers that were excluded, which uh, Kevin mentioned. Um, I did also just want to say something uh, overall about um, the nonprofit workforce. Uh, as part of the Human Services Advancement Strategy Group, we support critical investments uh, in the nonprofit workforce. Um, inadequate funding for fringe rates deeply impacts our membership. A number of city contracts, uh, particularly at DHS, cap fringe rates at arbitrary levels, sometimes as low as 26 to 28 percent, um, which is far lower than the standard um, and lower than the federal government rate of 37 percent. Um, additionally, the wages for human service staff are deflated as a result of the city underpaying contracted staff. Many contracted employees earn much less than city employees uh, with the same qualifications and position. And since fringe is a part, uh, is a percentage of that salary, uh, providers are also allocated fewer resources to fund those employees' benefits. So we recommend moving to a 37% fringe rate, which would align the city with federal standards and allow nonprofits to better meet the needs of their workforce. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Almost evening. Um, I'm Louisa Chafee, and uh, it's a great honor to testify to you today. I'm with UJA Federation of New York. The UJA, as you may know, works with over 100 nonprofits. We have some of the largest, some of the smallest. We're about two weeks older than Catholic Charities. We're also 100 years old. Um, and we're a proud member of the Human Service Advancement Group. Um, and now I'm going to put my reading glasses on because I can't read anything. So I don't want to reiterate the list of the issues that you've heard, starting with late registrations, but the UJA agencies suffer from the same agencies, same issues. Um, the city has taken great steps to address these issues, with the first with the creation of the R Nonprofit Resiliency Committee. And for full transparency, I want to be clear that I was actually named as a co-chair on the infrastructure, along with OMB. Um, the concept of a model budget was a transformative con um, initiative, setting the idea of a systemic standard analysis of costs of service that would across the board raise up the longstanding underfunding and correct a severely underfunded sector. But from the start, no clear guidelines or structures were communicated. There was minimal coordination and little transparency, and nonprofits were genuinely left behind. And when nonprofits found out about flexibility and how they could be used, um, they were not reflective of the business practices and thus added further delays. Um, so I want to talk a little bit specifically about HRA. Um, as you know, $1.6 million was added for HRA's Adult Protective Services model budget, which was basically to correct a pay parity issue between the Adult Protective Service Program and case management with DIFTA. DIFTA had um, been able to implement a much needed and absolutely critical raise in case management salaries. However, equal, equal title, equal pay, different agencies, one agency raised up by 15 million and the other agency, APS's workers, were left behind in salary. So the model budget was to correct that issue. Fifteen months later, the agencies with APS continue to wait for the model budget to be corrected. Many of these agencies are unionized, so they have paid their workers the raises that they were due. But it, this is on the nonprofits, and the city's commitment is um, long behind. So I want to be clear. New York proposed a brilliant, innovative solution to a complex operational and fiscal issue. We praise the concept. But the delivery has been tough, and we, knew we nonprofits need you, the city council, to keep stepping up. We stand with Hasag, 
um, in the various initiatives. And I'd like to uh, close in saying that if you'd like a new car, rather than just to replace the existing one, I would recommend looking at the Charter Revision Commission, because procurement starts with Chapter 13, and that's how you could solve it. Thank you. That's good. I like that idea. Yeah, that's very good. <laughs> um, and I just want to uh, say that I, I apologize for not having, not getting to the APS issues uh, while Commissioner Banks was here. We'll follow up Fif with, a, with a letter. 15 months, we will we're being told. We will, we will follow up with a, with a letter to them. We are um, grateful, from thank the, you. From the two chairs. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank and you very much. Great. Just to, to my co-chair, I just want to say, uh, this is par our, our, the, the length of this hearing, this, it's kind of par for the course in the General Welfare Committee, so <laughs> <laughs> welcome to my world. You get extra credit for this. Yes. We're, not even, we're not even at hour four yet. So I mean, like, <laughs> Thank you for that panel. All right, our next panel, we have Catherine Tapani, Trapani, sorry, from Homeless Services United, Elizabeth Clay Roy, or Ray, from Phipps, Mark Hurwitz from Urban Pathways, Joanne Page from the Fortune Society, Rob DeLeon from the Fortune Society, and Sister Florence Speck, or Spell, from from Fox House. All right, good afternoon. Good afternoon, guys. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Sister Florence, unfortunately, had to, had to leave, um, but she's one of our members. My name is Catherine Trapani. I'm from Homeless Services United. Um, and I just want to thank you for giving us the space. And, and, and Chair Levin is right that this is like nothing for, for general welfare <laughs> hearings. He always does a deep dive, and we really appreciate it. Um, so I have quite a bit to say. So I have submitted testimony um, for, for the record, but uh, just for, for the sake of time, I'm going to go through just sort of the breadth of uh, and depth of the problem for our collective membership. So we've gone over how delayed the DHS model budget process has been. And I just want people to understand what that means for our members. Um, people have had to max out their lines of credit, and they have to pay interest on those loans to their banks to the tune of the most generous estimate I could come up with was $1.25 million that we're spending um, because just on keeping up with the bank loans. And so we basically would have had enough money to privately fund a service-rich shelter for families for an entire year just based on the entrance payments alone. So, so we're wasting resources on nonsense. And so I just want to make that really clear. Um, we the, are typically, again, as generously as I can, about six months behind on the payment process. So we heard a lot about invoicing and timely payments. That's about $325 million, to my recollection, that our members are floating on a regular basis. And so I absolutely appreciate the history, the decades of disinvestment. This was not done overnight. It took us a long time to get here. So the commitment is historic, and I can't overstate how much we appreciate the commitment. But without the delivery of the dollars and the cash flow, I, the, our membership is really frustrated hearing, like, we invested. $250 million in homeless services. And the $146 million, which is for the existing contracts under model budget, is the biggest chunk of that, and it's not out the door. Um, so you know, we have quite a few suggestions on how to improve this process for the implementation, many, much of which is in our testimony. And we're going to be sending it over to uh, DSS. And so I encourage uh, you to look at that. And if I could just really quickly um, go through some of the top line ones of just the transparency with the way they did their framework. They sent us templates but no guidance on how to use them which is part of the reason that people don't know what the parameters are and explains a lot of the delays that the commissioner talked about and so I think that there's some homework to do for us to get some better communication going so we actually know how to respond the way they need us to so we can be better partners um, and we also need to have a mechanism to address what's not in the model budget and so we talked a ton about fringe which is hugely important
important. Um, and the other piece, and the final piece that I'll say, because I know I'm already over time, is about cost escalations. There is absolutely no mechanism that I'm aware of that will prevent us from having to do this in the future. So um, for our members that are trying to help the mayor implement the Turning the Tide plan and putting up the 90 new shelters, many of us are signing um, multi-year contracts, 20-year contracts in some cases, with no mechanism to understand what's going to happen in year 5, year 10, year 15, and year 20. So we're basically short funding ourselves already. And so we really need to look at escalation. Um, and that's something that uh, I'd really welcome your partnership and helping us figure that out. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for that testimony. And I look forward to reading through your written testimony. Um, uh, just, just want to commend the work that HSU has done representing uh, you know, a wide range of providers um, you know, one of the, the challenges here that I think we're all aware of, and I'm sorry, to, I don't mean to uh, uh, interrupt here, but um, that this, the DHS system is so wildly disparate compared to the ACS system. So uh, it was, it was, I think it was an easier task um, to, to implement the model budget process on the ACS side than on the DHS side. That said, I strongly implore, and I will continue to implore, the city, DHS, DSS, um, to work closely with HSU on all of these issues moving forward because, you know, we're, we're, we're our deadline, our original deadline is like next week. Yes. So um, it's only going to work if there's uh, significant coordination with the membership organization that represents the vast majority of these programs, um, and that's HSU, and they've done a phenomenal job. So I just want to thank you for the work that you're doing and strongly implore the city to keep up uh, the strong coordination because otherwise this is going to drag out much, much longer, and, and, and more and more programs are not going to be receiving the funds that they desperately need. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members, and thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Elizabeth Clay Roy. I'm the chief of staff at Phipps Neighborhoods. Um, we're a human services provider serving about 11,000 community members per year, um, primarily in the South Bronx. Um, and we help families overcome poverty through high quality education, career, and access to community resources. 80% of our $23 million budget is comprised of city and state contracts and contracts through seven different city agencies. I'd like to illustrate the severity of the delays in the contract payment process that we've experienced for some time but have been worse um, in this fiscal year. Um, as of this week, we're owed payments from public entities totaling $3.29 million. Um, these are for services that we've already provided to the community. The following are just a few examples, the outstanding payments, um, two beacon programs, and the Department of Youth and Community Development owes us $655,000, um, multiple contracts with community schools campus, a critical priority for the administration, um, the Department of Education owes us $635,000, universal pre-K programs, Department of Education owes over $240,000. And they're not short-term late payments, as has been discussed today. When we aggregate all contract payments that are over 120 days late, um, we're owed over $1.6 million. Um, in fact, many of these payments are tied to contracts that haven't been registered yet. We have 11 unregistered contracts with the city for services that have already been provided, which includes four contracts for services provided in the 2016-2017 school year. Um, we provided these services because we care so deeply about the success of Bronx students. None of them will get a second shot at sixth grade, but by providing services to students in hopes of being, hopes of being paid two years later is not sustainable. Um, contributing to the delayed payments are the multiple vendor review systems. After completing extensive disclosures through MOCs and um, being clear to proceed, payments are then held up for redundant review systems at agency levels. Um, and like many human services organizations, these payments have adverse impacts, um, like providing services in spite of late payments, which causes significant budgetary strain. Um, 
requires relying on bridge loans and reserves. Um, like many other nonprofits, we are faced with difficult choices. I just want to add one thing, um, which is that when we have delayed payments to vendors consistently, as do others in the sector, um, that has a significant impact on small and medium-sized businesses in the Bronx and other parts of New York City that work so closely with the nonprofit sector um, and themselves are adversely impacted, as are our community members and students who aren't able to receive the highest quality enrichment services because we aren't able to reliably pay vendors for what we have been contracted to do. Thank you very much and look forward to uh, further conversation. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mark Hurwitz from Urban Pathways. I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you so much for bringing attention to this really, really important issue. Uh, I'm gonna just try to make it simple for you. Urban Pathways focuses on helping people who are on the streets, who are chronically homeless, who have drug problems, who have mental illness, to get off the streets, to get into housing, and to thrive. And we do that with contracts from various agencies, um, state, city mental health agencies, but also with the Department of Homeless Services. Um, we're very successful. Just to give you a tidbit of what we do, our outreach teams placed 198 people uh, last year um, off of the streets and into permanent housing and 413 people into transitional settings. So that's the kind of work um, we do. We would love to have model contracts. That's the first thing I'm gonna talk about. We don't have model contracts because DHS focused specifically on shelters. The shelter system is the bulk of what they pay for. But if we wanna attack the very visible problem of street homelessness in the city, um, the outreach te uh, teams, the drop-in centers, we operate one um, in Times Square. The safe havens, we operate three, also need a, a model contracts. Safe havens are a place for someone who refuses to go into the shelter system because they find the, the large armory style shelters uh, that are often at the front end of the system intimidating. Um, so they'll come into these smaller, more service rich safe havens. Many of our um, programs like that have very outdated contracts. It's not just the fringe rates, it's things like psychiatric services that are getting much more and more expensive that we can't afford to provide uh, with outdated budgets. The, the second thing I'm just gonna quickly talk about is delayed contracts. Commissioner Banks um, suggested some of that was due to new rules about facilities. We have one contract um, that expires in a few days that we've for eight months said, come on, we gotta renew this contract. And um, only last night we finally started the process. Um, probably because of this hearing. Uh, and we've been reminding them since October, um, every month, please start the process. So um, we think there's great people at, um, at Homeless Services. I don't wanna suggest otherwise. There are a lot of individual people trying very hard to do their jobs um, all the way up to the top. Um, but this, the process isn't coordinated and there isn't the preparation that needs to be done in advance about how long is this gonna take. So we're going, in, going into the new fiscal year with no contract, and it just saps the administrative resources of an agency like ours to have to escalate these problems higher and higher in the agency and to have it be only at the top where you actually uh, finally get action. Thank you. I just want to add one thing to what you just said, and I think it's important to be also looking at um, street outreach and, and safe havens. So just one word about safe havens. I, I went out earlier this week and talked to some people um, around Penn Station who were, who were living on the street, and every single person that I spoke to, I spoke to about 10 people, every single person I spoke to uh, did not want to go into um, a large city-run single adult shelter at an armory, but, was, but was, would be eager to go into a safe haven if only uh, there was space for them and there were more programs up and running and that uh, they didn't have to meet some of the onerous requirements of having to be seen a certain number of times in a certain time frame and so on and so forth. But we're, everybody I spoke to was, was eager and willing to go into a safe haven and not willing to go into a large armory style armor, uh, shelter. So.
So, um, thank you. There we go. Okay. So uh, thank you, Chairs Levin and Brennan and, and uh, other committee members uh, for allowing us to testify today. Um, our CEO, uh, Joanne Page, couldn't be here today. Um, so my name is Rob DeLeon. I'm the Associate Vice President of Programs at Fortune. I'm here to testify on behalf of Fortune as, and as a member of the, the Human Services Committee. Um, and, and I'll also condense, you know, my, my testimony because, you know, we, you've heard a lot of the same things today. And so I just want to touch on some of the, the, the contracts and the amounts of money that we've had to front and, um, you know, that we've been held up on in the past uh, couple of years. Um, so and we've gone from serving uh, 3,000 men and women involved in the justice system in the past few years to serving uh, over 7,000. Um, and we've never seen the nonprofit community in New York under this much pressure uh, to achieve results with such tightening restrictions on government uh, funds. So um, one contract that I'll point to is the New York City Department of Corrections, DOC. Um, it's a $4,977,000 contract, um, the term from January 18 to January 19 to provide discharge planning for services to individuals incarcerated on Rikers Island. Um, that contract was executed on May 8th, um, 2018, and we had to uh, we had to front over a million eight hundred thousand um, uh, dollars. The City Council and, and Mock J uh, ATI initiative. This is a three hundred and ninety three thousand dollar contract, and the term is from July 17 to June 18, and it supports ATI reentry services for clients coming through our centralized admissions. Um, we actually have two years of still un unexecuted contracts for this ATI initiative. Um, and we're greatly appreciative of the City Council's support for the ATI initiative and its growth over the years. This delay is devastating to our cash flow. Um, I'll point to two more uh, uh, examples. New York City Mock J. Jails to Jobs contract. It's a $2 million contract. Um, the term is from January 18 to December. And it's to provide also transitional work to people preparing for release. Um, and those funds, the first payment on these funds were made on May 11th. And then on the New York City DOHMH uh, PHS transitional care for people with HIV in city jails. Um, it's a million dollar contract, a million point four. And um, the, 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 it's still not executed, this contract. And, our, and we've had to front to date $419,000. So the total cash fronted by Fortune in 2018 has been $3,330,000 as a result of delayed city contracts. Um, so, you know, we just ask the city council to do whatever you can to push for the needed changes. Um, if not, I'm afraid we'll see more nonprofits having to close our doors, as the example with FEGS. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll be unable to serve New York City uh, individuals that are in need of our services. Thank you. I just want to thank this entire panel for the work that you do in providing services to the New Yorkers most in need uh, throughout the five boroughs. And I, the, the hard work is done day in and day out by uh, your not-for-profits and not-for-profits like yours. So I just want to thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, we have our next panel. Um, Alan Wolinitz from Catholic Charities. Sophie Charles from COFCCA. Oh, Kafka, I see. Um, I can't read that. Oh, Allison Nickerson from Lebanon, New York. And Carlin from CPC. I used to think Kafka was spelled like, like Kafka. Franz though. Kafka. Franz Kafka. Yeah. Sometimes the process can seem Kafka. Yeah, it is right? Kafka. -esque. We might have to rebrand re that. But the contracting process, the, the model budget process, Kafka esque. Okay. Thank you for coming in. Whoever wants to start. We're going to start taking dinner orders soon. That, that's good. Salmon, please. All right, you got it. Uh, <clears throat> so, thank you, uh, Chairman Brennan and Chairman Levin, for the opportunity to contribute to this discussion around the model budget process. Uh, let me just say that uh, this is an excellent point and spot to be in because ACS has already delivered my testimony. Uh, I'm just here to say that uh, the mayor's 
administration's thinking around putting together this early collaborative engagement model uh, worked very well and it was a very strategic thing because all of our providers with contracts from ACS have benefited from it greatly. Uh, the other thing that I, I want to point out, and I'm, I'm, you've got my, my testimony there, I'm just going to just pull out a couple of phrases here. One is I want to say that we believe that this was the most collaborative initiative we have ever engaged in across any of the public sectors in terms of delivering a really good outcome. And I say that on behalf of all of the preventive providers. I was actually in the room for a series of about six meetings, a series of conference calls, and I can tell you the best part of the process is that if you can imagine ACS legal in the room, contract, members from the contract office in the room, and I've heard someone say that MOX wasn't involved, but we had members from OMB and MOX at almost every meeting, and it was the type of uh, <coughs> model configuration where we could get feedback on the spot. Providers would deliver uh, feedback regarding uh, disagreements or even some recommendations that they wanted in the model budget. And within 24 hours, we had some feedback and some adjustments to get uh, what those recommendations were. So that just speaks to the, the level, and I'm just co-signing on what ACS spoke about earlier. Uh, the two things that I would say that they didn't mention is that the providers had a lot of work to do. Um, we actually had to gather data within the, the various uh, agencies and programs, looking at staff turnover, and we had to produce some homework. So it really was jumping in, you know, with all elbows to help in a very um, active way to produce data to uh, support the directions that we were traveling in. And the other thing that I would say is that overall we believe the, pro the ACS team created an exemplary blueprint for a model budget process that could be replicated across the other city agencies. And again, the presence of legal, fiscal in the room uh, made it a, a really extraordinary feedback loop, very timely. And uh, they were laser focused. We worked for at least uh, eight to nine months on delivering that budget. So there was a lot of work that went into that. But I should also say that um, we would be remiss in our testimony if we didn't speak to the systemic barriers that threatened to erode the months of successful planning and the collaboration that occurred during the uh, process. First, the enhancements were constrained by the eight-year-old preventive services contract, which prevented certain investments. Even if those investments were very important, the city contract pro prohibited ACS from applying funds to OTPS to uh, direct services salary increases, capital investments, rent increases, fringe, and other areas that uh, the agencies have absorbed the high cost of delivering services to our families um, over the eight years. So there were some, some constraints around that. And the um, equally limiting is the application of the performance-based funding that's applied to the preventive services contract Performance-based funding is uh, the performance formula where ACS will hold 10% of the annual budget, uh, annual funds, if the providers do not meet certain performance targets. And it became sort of a, a very delicate balancing act for agencies to put 90% of their budget in accelerator um, while 10% is sort of held in some sort of a uh, <clears throat> withholding pattern. You know, I don't know what other way to say it, uh, but that was very challenging and it, that type of uh, performance-based funding configuration was not very uh, 
user friendly to put that formula into accelerator. So there were some complications around getting those budgets in and um, just want to make sure that there, there's an opportunity to streamline that process and to uh, provide some relief around that performance funding. We agree that performance is a rationale for measuring performance, but to, if you can imagine up front, you have uh, $100,000 and you're told that you can only use 90,000 for the year and at the end of the year, if you do really well, we'll provide your other 10%. That's not really good way to do a, an annual budget. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon, Chairman. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that good? Okay, good afternoon, Chairman Brennan and Chan Chairman Levin. My name is Alan Wallenitz. I am the Chief Financial Officer for Catholic Charities of Brooklyn and Queens. Um, as a point of reference, Catholic Charities has in place contracts now with the following city agencies, Department of the Aging, the Human Resources Administration, the Administration for Children's Services, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and the Department of Youth and Development. We currently have 60 contracts with a total dollar value of $57 million. And, and with those dollars, we serve 66,000 individual clients, which represents over a quarter of a million dollar, a quarter of a million client contacts during the year. So it's a, a fairly uh, big thing. We've been servicing our community for over 100 years. Not the oldest, which I learned a few minutes ago, we're the second oldest in the city. We have a dedicated and well-trained staff that has built an excellent reputation for providing superior service to all our clients across the broad spectrum of services. For the record, I just want to state that uh, Catholic Charities fully endorses the statements that were made by the Ser Human Services Council uh, of uh, Advancement Strategy Group. Um, but I want to spend some time, and I know time is short, talking specifically the issues that we have in developing our own operating budget for 2019. We are faced with ever-increasing administrative overhead costs and with greater dollars being spent with each successive year on, on programs and issues that are unfunded. Uh, and this problem is not caused by inefficiencies within our agency, but I'm sure with another not-for-profit as well, but by increased costs that are created by the current economic environment, rapidly changing needs for new technology, ever-increasing oversight and demands for more and more data to measure outcomes, as we've just talked about. These dollars are being spent and we are we don't see these costs going down. Um, let me go quickly through a couple of other major points. Um, some of the financial pressures that we're facing in, in doing our budgets now relate on the administrative side to recruiting, hiring, and maintaining qualified staff, particularly in the areas of finance and technology. We find that we're not competing for people in the, the not-for-profit environment, but with the general city economy. Uh, it's not unusual for us to hire somebody, stays six months, and goes to another for-profit uh, company for a $50,000, $60,000 salary increase. It's become increasingly difficult to maintain staff in the IT and fiscal side of the arena. Uh, on the medical and benefit side, in recent years, we have frozen our pension plan. Uh, we have asked our employees to make greater contributions to the cost of their plan and we go out for bid every year in terms of the providers and so forth. And despite taking these efforts, we're facing an ever increase cost over year with the percentages going up. Uh, having a good percentage of our services in Brooklyn, we're dealing with the real estate market in Brooklyn. So we're dealing with rents that are going up at an astronomical rate. It's a problem now and again, we see it being a big problem in the future. Uh, and lastly, just to say that the funding itself is, is an issue but the timing of funding. Uh, if the, fi the funding is not current, we're finding we're spending money, we have to go into a credit line, uh, go into loans, and which was not a major issue in past years when interest rates were staying low, but as an interest rate environment is rapidly increasing, the cost is becoming prohibitive. Um, so we ask uh, the council's help in providing adequate funding and doing it on a timely basis. Thank you for the opportunity to speak.
So it's possible the Catholic Charities might have to move from my district to, to Bay Ridge. <laughs> I don't even know if they can afford Bay Ridge anymore. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairs Brannon and Levin, for the opportunity to testify today and for your endurance in this process. Um, my name is Carlin Cowan. I'm the Chief Policy and Public Affairs Officer at the Chinese American Planning Council. CPC is the nation's largest Asian American social services agency, serving over 60,000 New Yorkers in all five boroughs each year. We are grateful for your attention to the issues that contracted nonprofits face and would like to share some findings and recommendations regarding contracts and the model budget process specifically. First is inconsistent transparency and provider feedback throughout the model budget process. Call me crazy, but I think that the people that do the work should have some input into the budgets for that work. We were invited to focus groups for the ACS model budget process, but there was no such thing for the DIFTA model budget process. Another major issue is slow notification and disbursement of uh, funding adjustments through the model budget process. CPC has received COLA and indirect increases through the model budget process on some of our contracts, but the notification has been slow and the disbursement of that even slower. For example, we were notified that uh, COLAs were going to be adjusted for one program and that that team's COLAs would be worth about $500,000. We still haven't gotten a disbursement from this and we've been waiting for it, so we ended up fronting it for the fiscal year 19 because we were losing staff so rapidly that the cost of replacing them was going to begin to rival the cost of fronting that COLA. While we've received some indirect increases, the disbursements of these have been slow and the rate of them is nowhere near the actual rate. Last year, our organization subsidized New York City $900,000 on indirect alone. On the subject of inadequate rates, the fringe rates that a lot of my colleagues have mentioned have been a persistent issue for our organization. Us providers face the double bind of having a significantly lower fringe rate than the city, and the base salary that the city pays our staff is so much lower than the city begins with that we're calculating an inadequate fringe on top of an inadequate salary. The gap between the city reimbursement on our fringe rate and the actual cost was $1.3 million last year. Now, I don't know if you've been following that, but that's $3.1 million that we've had to fill the gap for the city on last year, and that doesn't even begin to cover that for occupancy, insurance, OTPS, and even some core programming. With that money, we could have provided adult literacy classes to 3,600 more New Yorkers, high-quality dual-language education, after-school programs to another 1,030 young people, or senior programming for an extra 1,550 older adults. In closing, I believe that a model budget that doesn't include all of the costs of providing services, whether that be adequate salaries for our staff, the cost of meals for our home delivered meal programs, is just another underfunded contract and not a model for providing the services that New Yorkers need and deserve. Thank you. If I may, that, that I think very succinctly um, uh, encompasses the reasons why it's so essential that the city address this and not kick the can down the road. We're depriving people of services, core services, by withholding uh, an adequate fringe rate. Um, so, you know, this is not, uh, this isn't uh, a, a uh, something to, to, to be taken lightly or to, to pass along to the next uh, council and the next administration because this is impacting communities across New York City. So, thank you very much for putting it that way. Thanks. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Chairs Brennan and Chairs Levin, for having me here to testify. My name is Allison Nickerson. I'm the Executive Director of Live on New York. We represent all of the community-based aging services here in the city um, that serve every single neighborhood here in the five boroughs. Um, I am not going to echo all of the DIFTA-based information that a lot of my advocacy colleagues have raised, um, but I do want to applaud Mayor de Blasio, Commissioner Corrado, and the City Council um, led by Councilmember Chin for last year's $23 million of investments in senior services. I would do want to point out a few key issues that I see with the DIFTA model budget and with the senior service contracts going forward. Um, the focus that food did not have in the model budget is a major, major, major problem. Uh, food was the founding reason that the Older Americans Act was formed, and the fact that it was left out means that all of the 
um, work that goes into making a nutritious meal for about two dollars in some agencies as um, continues to be unrealistic and the expectation that people can provide halal and cult um, kosher and culturally appropriate meals is just unrealistic um, in addition I want to point out that the future of the city is growing old so we know in neighborhoods that have skewed young like Washington Heights or um, Long Island City, the demand for food and for senior services continues to rise at a rate that we haven't ever seen. So when I started in this field many years ago, everybody said baby boomers would never go to senior centers. That is not true. People are poor, they've taken out college loans, they have caregiving issues, and they need senior services. Um, I also want to point out that for all of our members, we have about 100 nonprofit members. The, um, they are essentially floating alone for the city of New York, right? So for a city that rivals the budget of many states, the inability to pay on time and to reimburse um, is, is crippling. Um, and they're unable to provide services under that environment. So I um, thank HSC and the work of bringing us together to compare the great work that's happening at other city agencies and to understand how we might be able to have some accountability so that there's some transparency and some shared lessons learned across the board. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Again, I want to thank this panel for all the great work. Yeah, thank you. This is our final panel? Okay, our final panel. Um, Philippe Martinez, Scott Huggins or Higgins? Hutchins. Hutchins, even better, from Picture of the Homeless. Mary Crosby from Picture of the Homeless. Keith Tribeck or Tribell from E2 Hospitality. And Tonkai Kawatsu, representing himself. Thank you all for coming in. Whoever wants to start. Um, yeah, Just make sure your mic's on. It's on. You're on. Good afternoon, good evening. No, no, now it's off. It was on. <laughs> <laughs> Hit it one more yeah, time. Just make sure the light is on. Light's got it on. There you go. Ah, there you go. Now we're good. <laughs> cool. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Felipe Martinez, a leader with uh, Picture the Homeless and a six-year resident of the dysfunctional shelter system that, they, that the city continued to invest in, creating more homelessness rather than permanent housing. DHS, HRA, and the shelter that I stayed at for five years all need to be put under a microscope and held accountable for the mistreatment of folks navigating the shelter system as we tried to get into permanent housing. Um, when SUS took over back in 2015, I have only ever had three housing visits from that time frame up until I was transferred recently. All of them were for shared room apartments. Everybody knows that um, major crimes happen within housing is usually within shared rooms. I don't see how that's going to work out for me. Miss Elizabeth Blackstone, the director of the shelter at 599 Ralph said to my face back in August 2015 when they took over and again back on May 5th, 2016, which was the time of Callahan inspection. I'm going to see to it that you, Mr. Martinez, will not get housing. True to her word, up until when I was transferred, that has happened, which is why I'm here. Um, last year, May, 17, um, May 2017, last year, an FJC security guard started a confrontation with me, and it was over to the fact that I actually seen him purchasing drugs from another client there, hand in hand. So he thought that I was gonna go ahead and um, let's just say the word snitch, if that's all right with you guys. The guard, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you. Um, 
When I went through that situation, I was shook, I, meaning that I was scared. I didn't know what to expect of. I didn't know what was the outcome. He verbally came at me. I came back at him because I didn't know where he was going after he had threatened me. To make a long story short, I don't know what can anyone from HRA literally tell me when somebody like myself had been here for six years in the system. I, I don't know if anybody here have any relatives or family members that's in the system. Processed food, 269 million for HRA. Funny how that Mr. Banks is saying that, but I'm not seeing that as a resident. That hasn't helped me. I've been in altogether five shelters and one building for five years. I think that that needs to be held accountable as well. That's why I was saying what I was saying within the director there, you know? And um, truth be told, I don't really deserve that. I have a 12-year-old son. So for them six years that I've been there and being in this system, the truth be told of, my son was six when I first got in the system. You understand what I'm saying? He's 12 years old now, sixth grade. The last thing I want is my son for every year to keep asking me what is going on with my housing. How is that gonna benefit me? My family looking at me like I'm a failure at the same time. I don't deserve any of that. I have two house, I had two housing packets and none of them are really worked in out. The Link 5 program up until I got injured at work, that haven't benefited me and then I was cut off from it because I wasn't physically able-bodied. That was the excuse that they say. That's the problem also with the system. Everything is all based on specifics. I have a solution to that. I feel like there should be a letter system. The same thing that you apply within the food service industry, the same thing should be applied within the shelter system. If there is one or more violations in each of these shelters, right, and you guys inspect it, and there's one or more, there's one or more failures to that, guess what? They get a D or an F. If everything is all updated and everything is intact, then they should get an A grade. But if you do for a second time, for the ones that, the, that they failed the inspection the first time, if that shelter happened to get checked again for the second time, and none of, the, none of the things have been kept up and it's still the same way, then that shelter should be closed. Um, I don't know how else to go about it. I don't know how else to explain it. But I do have, I feel like that that, from what I just mentioned to you guys, I think that should be looked into. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My name is Scott Andrew Hutchins, and I have spent six of my over 14 years in New York living in the New York City shelter system, having earned a master's degree here in 2005. As a member of Picture of the Homeless's Research Committee, I have one of the principal authors of the Business of Homelessness. I was appalled when I discovered the director of the so-called nonprofit that ran the shelter I was living at the time made nearly half a million dollars a year, and that the seven top executives at the organization received about half of the entire city compensation the charity receives. According to the IRS, charities may pay a reasonable compensation for services provided by officers and staff. It is simply not plausible that running a shelter in which the residents live in, in squalor with painful cots, small lockers, and meager and poor quality food is reasonably compensated at a rate of half a million dollars, which the U.S. Census Bureau considers to put one in the top 5% of earners in Manhattan. Poor building upkeep is normal. At my current shelter just two days ago, a sprinkler pipe fell down and flooded the case manager's office, dousing much of the paper documentation. I told the Department of Buildings and they told me that they were familiar with the building's many code violations but said they would forward my message to DHS because they said DHS owns the building. As with most of the eight shelters in which I have stayed, mice and cockroaches are a common sight and someone else in my room said he often sees rats near the radiator. Even the hotel shelter I was in previous to this one had the bathroom floor cave in and collapsed drywall behind the wallpaper. Most of the shelters have job specialists, but I have yet to meet one with the competence to help someone with high education and medical challenges that make low the low-wage physical labor they know how to get people untenable. And most housing specialists are completely oblivious to the daily reality of source of income discrimination, suggesting that the word specialist is being very loosely applied. This shows that far more oversight as to how shelter contracts are written is necessary, 
As it stands, the money is effectively being given away and raided by a few executives while crumbs go to the intended effects that keep the shelters unlivable. The service providers clue do not know how to properly use city funds and need to have their discretionary spending severely curbed until they can demonstrate that they can properly prioritize their resources. It is hypocritical that shelter providers have so few restrictions while shelter residents and public assistance, assistance recipients have so many. Thank you, Scott. Hi, um, I'm Tawaki Komatsu. I've testified at your meetings previously to no avail. Um, I guess th the main reason why I come to these meetings is to fuel my rage at the fact of um, due to your inaction and complacency that uh, drives this problem. Also censorship by reporters like Yov Gonin from the New York Post, who I reached out to on December 21st of 2016, um, partly on behalf of a Marine Corps veteran who hasn't received squat in terms of services in two years. So HUD was in the, in in the building where I reside in the last week, about two years after the fact. So if I'm coming to these meetings telling you um, guys truthfully, as opposed to Mr. Banks, who is a total fraudster and lies to your face, um, where I can prove it, I've recorded um, conversations I've had with him on audio. Anyway, let me stop then and read from this email I sent to Yov on uh, December 21st of 2016. Sorry for the, actually, sorry, he wrote to me. Sorry for the delay, it's been busy at City Hall. Do you have a copy of the two different leases? Are all the apartments shared in the building? Um, on, I think, April 24th, Nicole Bram said of Urban Pathways was sitting in the chair I'm sitting in. She talked about doubling up roommates, roommate conflict. Like I told you previously, I got assaulted because of that. We had Mark Hurwitz over here earlier today. He's a legal officer for Urban Pathways. They committed baits and switches for the lease agreements for everyone in the building. So if you guys, through the 1515 program, are even considering giving them an extension of business, what the hell are you thinking? Um, if I got a concussion from those 15 punches, again, what the hell are you thinking? Um, on March 5th, Mar the guy's uh, living across the hall, he sent me an email about an assault involving him and his roommate after I was assaulted. So if I get 15 punches to my head, don't you think you guys should provide some oversight so that other people in the building also don't get attacked? Um, I also talked to you guys previously about wage theft. HRA is doing business with NTT Data that still hasn't paid me. You told me to follow up with you. I have. There's been no recourse. So bottom line is tomorrow I'm going to walk into court to essentially void the contracts HRA has with NTT Data, with Urban Pathways, with SUS. So this is my last appearance here. Okay, thank you. Okay. We are adjourned for today. Thank you guys so much.